All right, we're live. Welcome, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us tonight for another episode of Monday Night Monster Jam. This is episode number eight. Can you believe it? We're up to eight already. We're uh, cranking through these things faster than I thought we would. Um, I'm joined tonight by the awesome two guys that helped me get this stream going and keep it running smooth every time. Sam Catarasano. Hello. And, of course, Ryan Endersby. Here we go. Ryan? Hey, everybody. So, tonight, what do we got? Well, we got round two for you of mask painting. Um, last week, I mentioned we were going to do some ear sculpting. Well, we decided let's hold off on that one till next time. And the reason being is a lot of people were writing me after the show, letting me know how much they really enjoyed the mask painting tutorial and the skin and everything. So... And I wasn't finished with the Cyclops, so I decided let's let's bring him back for round two. So we're going to do some more skin work tonight, uh, share some more techniques with you guys, uh, push it further, push the paint job further, and um, get into just some more more work overall. And, and uh, of course, as always, we'll take questions later in the stream, uh, talk about giveaways, talk about artist influence, guest spotlights, you know, things like that, artist spotlight that we're doing every time at 7. So we're going to have a pretty packed show tonight. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, as always, we'll start off. Ryan, why don't you take over, and let's just see who's joining us for this show tonight. All right, Casey, we've got 37 people tuning in right now, but we'll start from the top with folks who have chimed in. We'll start with Mr. John Eubank. Awesome. We have Kevin Young. We have T-Tan joining us. We have Chris Dawson, Creative Mutation, Jason Gessonetti, Freddie Nail, Mark Hansen, Matt Cable, Carpe Diem 2020, Brian McCruden. Let's see, did I cover? Uh, the list is growing quite rapidly. We got Matt McNeil. Let's see, did I cover Creative Critter? Yep. Susan Atai, Jerry PF, Ella Bellato. Uh, let's see. Make sure we got Mr. Dawson, Neil, we're good to go, Casey. We've got awesome. we're chiming in now. Killer. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, we appreciate it. We greatly appreciate it. This, you guys that make this work for us, <clears throat> you know, I'm just here to share techniques, uh, and we're here to make this live stream as cool as we can make it. Um, a special shout out, thank you to uh, Matt McNeil. Matt has been helping us behind the scenes a little bit too with some suggestions. The suggestions were awesome. Thank you so much, Matt. We really appreciate thank that. You, Matt. Thank you, thank you. And we we're already putting those into effect. So, anyways, uh, let's see. Let's see. What are we doing first? I don't know. Let's get this going. I think it's time to paint more Cyclops. That's what I think it's time for. Um, and. So, leaving off last week, we did some basic skin techniques. I showed uh, sponging, spattering, airbrush work, um, uh, you know, all the different layering system that I do or, you know, that I tend to go with my process of layering the skin. And uh, tonight, I'll just keep pushing that a little further and, and uh, see where it goes, you know. You guys are basically just seeing me make up a paint job on this thing from scratch, you know. There's no pre-thought or pre-worked um, out anything. It's just me working on this mask and coming up with the look, uh, how this thing's going to look and how I'm going to paint it. So you're just following me along with my process. All right, so... Uh, I say we get going here, um, and while I kind of set up a little bit, Ryan, you want to talk about any newcomers that just joined us in the stream? We can just give a shout out to any new ones you see. There's a couple. Oh, uh, sounds good. We've got Jason Wilwright. We have the real Chip Diamond, and let's see. Did I cover this one? Uh, Zef Pacifico. Okay. Awesome. Cool. Any of our fans out there and family, Monday Night Monster Jam family, any of you guys, I got a question for you guys. <clears throat> um, anyone go to the Danzig concert 
uh, in Ontario, California this last weekend on Saturday night. If you did, I was there. Danzig sounded awesome. The band, band I can't talk tonight. That's great. The band sounded amazing. They killed it. Uh, Tommy Victor on guitar from Prong is just absolutely incredible. He just really nails um, the the tone and the sound for Danzig. Anyway, I thought it was a great show. It was good to see Danzig. They played the whole second album from start to finish, which was amazing. I mean, I've never seen that before from from Danzig. So that was awesome. It was awesome to see. And uh, thanks to my good buddy Frank King for the hookup on the ticket tickets. Again, I can't pronounce words tonight. This is going to be an interesting stream, guys. I'm telling you. Uh, and uh, it was rad. You know, took my daughter with me. We had a blast. We were rocking it out. So if any of you guys went, let me know. <clears throat> okay. Let's make sure the airbrush is working. I need some paper towel. <laughs> Winking at my wife. <laughs> All right. What are we going to start with first on this Cyclops? Let's see. I don't know. I kind of have to find my way back into this as well from last weekend and see where I want to go with it. So we covered some veins and some stuff like that. I think I'm just going to pop in, you know, I think I'm going to go back to some sponging, which will be good. I could show you guys some of that technique again. Everybody really seems to dig that technique. Um, it's a great one. I think I'll do some cool, maybe cool down a little bit on him, just a, a touch. So I think we're going to go into some gray blue tone first. <clears throat> Have you done anything to him since last week? No, I haven't touched this guy since last week. Yeah. So just didn't have time, you know, I was thinking of taking him further, but you know, uh, we had the weekend, we had mother's day, happy mother's day to all you moms out there. <laughs> And, um, yeah, so. What did everybody do for Mother's Day? Yeah, what did everyone do for that? That's, that's a good question. And I'm just mixing up a little kind of gray-blue tone here. You know what? I'm going to put it in my palette here because otherwise I can't sponge it. And then I'm just using water, guys, right now to, uh, you know, water out. Thin out, thin out the color, you know, and that that allows me to be able to sponge it real nice and uh, and so it's not too heavy going on. You know, I always thin it out with water first, um, or water only. Sorry, and uh, I don't use any alcohol for this step. You don't want to do that. You'll take your paint right off. So that's not good. You're working backwards that way. Um, and then what I do is I wet this sponge right here really well, you know. In fact, let me switch sponges, switch to a better one. I have a little bit better sponge here. And we want to get that nice and, and, and wet and ready to go. And so what this does, this is a, a sea sponge. I used it on the last stream for those of you that joined us. And uh, it's got these little bristle tips on it. And I use one side, usually this side, to sponge the color on. And then I use the other side to tone it down and, and take the, the color off. Uh, sorry, not take it off. Uh, soften it. Soften it down. So I'm going to show you that right now. So let's uh, take some color here. And you have to test this uh, if it's too harsh. Um, you know, you'll, you'll have to tone it down a little. And I think I might even just throw a, a little bit of uh, white into this color just to lighten it a little. So, and then we're gonna, gonna mix this. I'm gonna thin it out more because you know you have to test it out and see if you like it. If it's a little too heavy like there's not it's too uh, concentrated basically then you want to kind of tone it back uh, uh sorry thin it out more <laughs> all right some streams go smooth and some don't yeah <laughs> casey's only monkeying around for 15 minutes 
All right, yeah, here we go. So, okay, that's better. I like that better. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna come into the skin here with this blue. This might seem a little strange, but you'll see. It's a little, it's gonna kind of cool him down a little bit, uh, which I wanna do. One thing I was able to look at him and think about what, what I wanna go further with. I, I wasn't able to do anything, but, um, cause I didn't have time. But one thing I knew was, oh, I wanna cool him down a little. So I'll just work my way around breaking up. This is just another layer. You know, that's a great thing. You know, you don't have to seal. This is a good thing I can talk about is you don't have to seal. And I, I never really do this. Actually, I, I never do it on, on masks. I shouldn't say I never do it because I, I do it on other things like model kits or statue painting at work. But what, what I'm not doing here, uh, and this is a subtle technique here that, that just slightly cools the skin down, but I'm not uh, sealing between layers, you know, to protect any under layers or, or give myself this, uh, you know, sort of protecting coating that, you know, if I mess up on accident, no, I, I, you know, I don't do that on masks. I always just seal at the very end. So, you know, this was sitting around for a week since last Monday. And, you know, just deciding, okay, what does it need? Uh, no, there's no hurry to finish it. What else can I do to it? And you just, I just sit and look at it sometimes, you know, from a distance. I'll just look at the character and things will start coming to mind, you know, like the cool, cooling him down, you know. I was like, okay, I think he needs that a little bit. That would, that would help um, cool the skin off just a little. So anyway... That's where we're at right now. Uh, one other thing that I thought might be interesting, and maybe I'll, I'll do this tonight, because it can be, I think for some, it could be a scary technique to do, because if you mess up, it can be bad. <laughs> but maybe we'll give him um, uh, the look of like a shaved head or something, you know, like wherever his hairline would have been. I'll spray some some grays and things to give him like looks like his head has been shaved or something like you know his hair um, that might be a neat one for him um, and overall just more layers layering uh, you know within the skin and I'll show you kind of a final sponging layer that I like to do that uh, really brings a lot of translucency to the piece so, and, you know, maybe more speckling and stuff. And, you know, maybe we'll even get to basing out the eye and, and uh, uh, doing some teeth. We'll see what we can fit in tonight's show. Who knows? Maybe this will turn into a, a third show. Who knows? I don't know. Jeez. All right. So I'm just sponging away. So as you see, what I do, if, you, if you're paying attention, I, 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 I sponge on with one side here. And then I use, I flip the sponge over you know, to the, to the clean side and just take off paint or sorry, soften down paint. I shouldn't say take, I, it is taking off. I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Just watch what I do. <laughs> I just make monsters. I don't know anything else. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> Casey, I'll throw in a small anecdote here. You had asked about uh, Mother's Day, what we're up to. And I don't consider myself like a garden gnome type of guy, but that's what I was doing this weekend. So I, a lot of the moms here on my side of the family, they, they really dig those garden gnomes. So I was sculpting <laughs> like seven-inch collectible garden gnomes, I guess. Uh, <laughs> it did okay, though. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, you were doing something fun. That's what's important. That's good. Um, yeah, we just chilled, um, you know, my wife and I were exhausted, we have long work weeks and things, and, and, you know, we have a lot to do during the week, kids and school, and so we, usually when the weekend comes, we're just like, uh, you know, just zoning out, cleaning the house, whatever, 
or usually I'm laying on the couch and my wife is cleaning the house. That's, say, that'd be more correct, <laughs> actually. Couch situation. <laughs> that would be more accurate. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, a subtle hint usually comes. You gonna clean the bathrooms? Yeah, yeah, I guess. No, I was, I yeah, I was exhausted last night, man. I just, I fell asleep uh, on my wife. Wait a minute. Oh what? my god, what am I saying? Bro. That just sounded wrong altogether for you two. I fell asleep in front is of my wife. Channel? Is it? <laughs> uh, this is gonna be a weird show. All right, so I fell asleep. In front of my wife because I was just so dead tired. I, we were what were we watching, hun? Outer Outer Range, Outer Range, which is a great show, by yes. the way. Uh, how would you describe that? Like Twilight Zone meets Western sort of sci-fi thing. Anyway, it's really cool. It's on Prime. Uh, what's that actor that's in it? He's awesome. He played Thanos. Uh, Josh Brolin. Josh Brolin. Yes, there you go, Josh Brolin. I think I saw some promotional stuff for that. Yeah. It's cool. Uh, so, yeah, but I fell asleep, as usual. And uh, <laughs> that was that. Um, but, yeah, no, we yeah we, we just chilled out, you know. And what else? Did, oh, well, I went to Danzig, of course. So that, was, that wasn't really chilling out, but that was, that was fun. That was your Mother's Day gift? <laughs> that was my early Father's Day gift to me, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Um, oh, we watched uh, the new UFC fight, the U UFC. Oh, my God, that. If any of you guys saw the UFC or watched the UFC, whoo, that uh, leg kick uh, that Chandler threw uh, at uh, Ferguson, man. Holy moly. That was one of the worst knockouts I've ever seen. That was brutal. Leg knockouts crap out of me. He caught him under the chin with the ball of his oh. foot and knocked him out cold oh and God. his head crashed into the ground. Oh. Lights out. It was crazy. Crazy. And then followed the most boring fight the UFC has ever seen. I'm not going to mention names, but you saw it, you know what I'm talking about. Boy, that was hard to watch. Uh, anyway, we watched that. It was cool. And then the main card was awesome. You know, Oliveira versus, uh, um, oh man, don't even look at you. I am so bad with names. Oliveira versus, uh, Gaethje. Justin Gaethje. Oh my gosh. Anyway, so that was awesome. Uh, so that was my weekend, you know, and then, uh, here we are. Monday night. Monster jamming. Okay, so as you guys hopefully can see with Sam's amazing camera work, because he's a master of that, uh, you can see that this is now very cooled down or fairly cooled down. Um, and just that sponging layer, it, you know, that, that new layer, it just adds and adds to the skin and the realism. It really helps. Um, so that's a good trick for you guys that you know if if you're um needing to cool a mask down and you don't want to do the overspray trick where sometimes things can get chalky or with overspraying an airbrush you know a lot of times you'll you'll wash out these warm areas like around the eye or or areas that you don't intend to uh, look chalky can get chalky on you it's kind of a term uh, chalky is just the term of how it you know looks kind of dusty so uh, th this is a great way to work around that problem and more, a more focused way. So when you put red on with a sponge, it's going to warm the mask up. When you put blues on, it's going to cool it down, especially like light gray blues and so on and so forth. So warm tones, warm it up, cools, cool it down, you know. And so it seems weird to take a blue, like a Smurf blue color like this <clears throat> and then go over it. But you can see how subtle and soft it is and and because I watered it out, thinned it, put it on in a very specific way and sponged it and then took it off. And so it just leaves a light broken up layer of blue. So what you don't want is for it to look on the skin as bright blue as it looks in this container. That would be weird, you know, unless you're doing some kind of alien thing. But this, anyway, there you go. That's, that's, uh, we're just recovering sponging. And these sea sponges you can buy at 
you know, craft stores, um, hobby stores, you name it. Um, usually craft stores like Michael's or, or Joann's or uh, what else is there? Hobby Lobby. I, I don't know what your craft store is where, you're, where you live, but check those places. Those are, those are good places to go and pick up uh, sea sponges. If not, just hit up Amazon. The great thing about picking them up in person, though, is you can pick them out because they all vary. And what you want, uh, I always tell people, get these more rounded, prickly-looking ones uh, because they work best for this technique. All right, so we'll put our sponge away for a minute. We're done with Mr. Sponge. And let's, let me dump this color before I spill it all over my lap. Clean my palette off here. All right. Back to business. <clears throat> and now we got to decide a couple things. Um, I know for sure. Let me go ahead and just so I can better see a little bit. I'm going to kind of base coat this eye just in case we do end up having time to get into the eye. Um, so, And what I'm going to do is take some white, but then I think I'm going to tone it down a little bit so it's not so stark and crazy because you put white straight on and it's you know can be like really overpowering so let me put a little bit of this color Let's see if this might be too much but we'll see i have a little water left over from the sponging in there so that's good um i was getting a lot of questions uh off stream uh, regarding the skin tone that I started with on the stream last week, you know, what, what color was that, you know, that, that looked really good. Um, so thank you to all you guys that, uh, hit me up with that. I, you know, I, I base coated this mask ages ago. Um, like, you know, like over a year ago or so when I got it from Jeff and I, I don't really recall the exact color. Cause sometimes I just pre -mi I just mix the color myself but I think I used, um, or what you could use, which would be very close, if not exactly the color that I use. It could have been. I have to check. But I, there's some uh, paints by Delta Ceramcoat, which are those cheap uh, craft paints you can get at like uh, Hobby Lobby and stuff. Um, sometimes even uh, Target carries them, but they only carry a select few. There's hundreds of colors. So it's better to go to a craft store that carries the, almost the whole line. But they make like trail tan and tan tones. And I just, I mix that right out of the bottle without thinning. It's very thick paint. I mix it with Prosade uh, glue and then, and then brush it on as a base coat. And that's what it is. And, and the reason it's flexible is because the glue. So uh, I think it was trail tan or one of those colors. That'll get you there. I might have mixed a little flesh and sometimes warm it up a little with a little red. Uh, red. I don't remember though. It was it was literally so long ago. So now I'm gonna base this eye with a brush. So let's just go in here and just give it a, a little layer. So I toned the white down too. You know, I put a little bit of that sepia brown by golden uh golden colors and um that tones the white back a bit so it's just not so blaring um because if you go straight white it can be a little crazy and I, I find that i have to tone it back anyway so why not just start there you know i have to do this a lot when it comes to the smaller scale stuff too because on smaller scale if you have uh, gleaming white eyes it can look really ridiculous it looks really weird. So I've been incorporating it into masks more too now. And you don't have to be super perfect about getting right. I mean, I try to get really nicely to the edge where the lid is, but if I get a little uh, paint uh, beyond it, I don't worry too much because I'm going to end up spraying around the eyelid and adjusting and correcting and all that good stuff. So a few little layers of this and then we should be done with the with the base coat.
for the eye. At the very least, we should be able to rough the eye out in there and get get some something going on. <clears throat> How are we looking, Ryan, on our our uh, everybody that's joined us? Where are we at now with everyone? Uh, Casey, you're rocking it this evening. I have to say, you've got about uh, 60 concurrent folks at the moment, and we're starting to collect some questions for round two here. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. Very cool. Thank you, everyone uh, that's joined us tonight. Appreciate that. Uh, for those of you who are new to the stream, perhaps, uh, please, uh, what you can do uh, to help us out uh, is like and subscribe to the channel. And we can continue to bring you guys more and more of these videos and more and more content. We have lots of uh, ideas coming for sh for shows. Each and every Monday we'll be here. Uh, and, you know, that, that's great. You know, it helps us out if you guys can just throw us a little like and subscribe if you haven't done that already. <clears throat> And we have a Facebook group. If you if you haven't joined and you don't know, we have a Facebook group called Monday Night Monster Jam on Facebook, and you can join that group and share your art or just look at what everyone else is doing. Uh, talk to everybody from the stream plus beyond. It's really cool. Lately, uh, people share daily there. It's awesome. It's a great group of people over there. All right, so now we've got the eye kind of roughed out. What else do I want to do? You know, another thing is that's a good color that I just did. You could even do teeth, uh, you know, with that color. I'm not going to – I don't know if I'm going to do this right now, but, um, you know, you could you could come in and – I mean, I could come in and do the teeth. <laughs> but, yeah, well, might as well, right? What the hell? I've got the color mixed up. It'd be kind of, I guess, maybe dumb not to do it. I'm just going to put a light layer over the teeth. Sometimes I've used the, the actual color of the latex to do the teeth, you know, just, just stain. But, you know, sometimes um, it will, uh, the teeth will get a little darker on you over time. So it could, it's good to give them a little base tone. You don't have to go completely opaque on them, though. You can leave a little latex showing through which is what I'm doing here. Another cool thing is I have, <clears throat> I'm going to, or I don't have, but I'm going to make some uh, lower, to customize this mask, I'm going to do some lower tusks out of Sculpey right here and glue those in. And uh, that'll change the look of him to more of an ogre-esque style uh, character. Which will be cool. I've done some uh, mask customization stuff in special effects. So it's a lot of fun. I I got to customize a number of masks on uh, Men in Black Three when I worked for for Rick Baker. Uh, just so you know, just so that they weren't just so standard. Uh, they, and also, they were masks that had been in uh, previous men in black movies so to change up a little bit and make them look more fresh and new even though they weren't i uh, gave them completely different paint jobs than what anyone had you know seen before in the film and then we uh, added some customizing features you know tentacles or or uh, antennas or extra weird whatever you know parts or appendages or whatever it was you know we just I just come up with stuff and customize it. Uh, I had access to a bunch of silicone parts. I actually glued silicone pieces to latex. That was pretty cool. So uh, you can you can do a lot to change uh, a mask. And the great thing about that for you for you mask makers out there following this, you know, you have a mask. Um, you know, you you can add make things out of latex and and add them on to change the mask up. You don't have to just stick with the uh, the mask the way it is. You know, maybe you come up with an afterthought, like, oh man, it would have been cool if I did this. Um. So, in fact, I had a friend uh, recently. He has one of my 
purple people eater masks and he added little tiny wings to the back of it which was really interesting because i had thought all along it needed wings i mean i did the one eye the one horn but i didn't have the wings <laughs> and uh, the wings were it was a big huge mask uh, uh like a big kind of weird mutated octopus looking head and um he he did what I and it was so crazy because he did exactly kind of what I I thought would be interesting is th this monster so gigantic it'd be cool, funny it'd be kind of funny and cool if it had wings you know so small that it wasn't able to actually fly <laughs> or use them really um so like useless tiny wings but um yeah and he he went and did that he took some wings from a toy or something and then had him re. Uh, he had my buddy Monty Ward repaint them and put them on, and so it, it looks awesome. It's so cool. So customizing masks is cool. You can, you know, get away with some interesting things <clears throat> that maybe you didn't think of when you sculpted it originally. Or, but I don't know why when I look at this guy, I see ogre. You know, ogre probably because it looks very ogrey to me anyway. So there we got some teeth based out now. Um, white. Yeah, or pearly. Not so pearly white. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're going to get nice and stainy. By the time I'm done, it'll look like he needs to go to the dentist for sure. Um, so there, we utilized uh, the eye color and the for the teeth as well, um, which is fine. It'll look good. Um, I'm not sure how I want this eye to be exactly. Probably just go center with it, but we'll see. All right. So usually at this spot, you know, again, um, what I usually like to do is just look around at the mask and see what else I think it needs, you know. Um, there's multiple layers of colors and different things you can do with skin. Uh, so I'm just taking a quick look through at it and seeing what it what it might need. Um, all right, so I think we'll go back to some airbrushing layers. Uh, definitely need to get this lip going a little bit better. So let's see what we got here for colors. Now, I'm going to be using all kinds of different paints. One guy asked me, uh, sorry, I forget the name. I'd have to go back and look. He asked, well, how come you're not using your paints on this? And I do use my paints. Uh, I just happened to pull out what I happened to pull out at the time. And funny enough, these Freak Flex paints are made by the same company that, that makes my paints, the Casey Love paints. Um, so it's the same company I'm promoting here and, and uh, Badger Freak Flex. These are great, by the way, if you don't haven't used the Freak Flex. Now, these aren't the same as the old Freak Flexes. Everyone from the model kit industry knows the old Freak Flex paints. And uh, they were great, but the, they would clog your, uh, they would, or they would hard, be hard to clean out of your airbrush. And uh, I don't know, there was just a different formula back then. Now this formula, I know you couldn't thin them with alcohol either, but this formula you can. It's a different, it's definitely different. I don't know what they did. Um, I have no clue there, but great. They're great, and I use them all the time. So, yeah, same company as as mine. Uh, it's made by Badger, so, you know, there you go. Um, okay, so let's start with some of this first of all. And then maybe just some red. Let's see. I'm just mixing up a little color here. It's maroon. If there's any left. Okay. And now this time around, I'm going to spill the paint <laughs> and um but i'm going to put a little water in as you just saw and then i'm going to 
This time I'm going to put the alcohol in. I use 99% alcohol. A little bit in there. So adding the water thins the paint a little bit so that um, it can accept the alcohol without problem. You know, getting without getting uh, weird and all coagulated and weird on me. So I always thin with water first, and then I follow up with alcohol afterwards. So okay, so now we have a nice red tone here. And what I'm going to do is kind of warm up uh, or just go into this lip a little bit. There's uh, some areas that down in the, the bottom here, the inside need to be painted because it's just almost raw latex. And uh, it's going to look a little weird and red at first, but I'll adjust, adjust it as I go. So everything is you know, laying some color in and then adjusting, laying some color in, adjusting, uh, stuff like that. Can't, I got a shadow over here, can't really see. Let's see. Okay. And right, now I'm going to kind of, once I've got this inside of this, this lip here, which the great, one of the great things about masks, and I've said this before, is you can, push you can kind of push out there's like an undercut and you can't get the color in there you can push it out with your finger because it's flexible and spray in there i'm going to get black in there eventually real dark so that it looks like it really goes back far which it you know it goes back pretty far but Can't forget about the top lip. We need to get that too. So we're just punching some red in and then come back and tone it down a little bit. And I'm going to use this color to accentuate some other things. Looks like he's almost got a lip injury right here or something. I mean, it might just be a wrinkle, but kind of looks cool. I can kind of accentuate it to be more of an injury. Gonna redden out this nose with some modeling. Now, when I model with uh, these colors, this very fine sort of spider web. I don't do this. You'll see a lot of videos of, uh, on YouTube or wherever, or just in general, where people tell you to model and they they go and they do something like this. Here, I'll show you. They go and they go, yeah, you just you do this. You just make spaghetti lines everywhere, and it's like, no, that's not what you want to do. Do you, when you see that, do you see that on somebody's skin? You never see that on somebody's skin. That's not how skin looks. So you should never be doing figure eights or, or, or this noodley stuff. That's not how a professional, you know, a special effects guy or, or painter paints modeling. When you model the skin, it should replicate kind of what your skin looks like. You know, which is way more and i'll just demo demonstrate it here because you'll see what i mean it's much more natural if you do something along these lines like this okay that doesn't look like something on my skin that does and to, to further my point if i went on my skin and i did this let's see if it blends into my skin does that look like it goes to my skin? No, it doesn't go to my skin. That doesn't look like skin, but let's see if I can do this. What if I did it this way, the way I just showed? Let's see if it disappears. So that looks like my skin. This does not. So you never want to do this as modeling. This isn't modeling. So anyone teaching this, they just don't know what they're doing when it comes to modeling skin correctly. You always want to go with this softer, broken up feel. Like it's bro like it's soft dotty connections not dotty though don't do dot 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 but you know like more of a dotty you know and when i tell people like think of an old man drinking a cup of tea you know you know he's like all shaky 
and then just barely let the paint come out and let the paint randomly be a little looser and heavier in areas than then you know you get a little more naturally you get a little more heavier areas and lighter areas that's how you want to model your skin um with all the tones that you're going to you know whatever the tone is you're doing blue red white off white flesh that's how you want to do it okay now I'll get off my modeling soapbox there i just wanted to share that with you guys because i think it's an important tip that you don't really see a lot of people explaining um and and uh you know i think it's important to know because it can make a world of difference uh when you're painting masks and, and things that you want to look realistic you know whether it's a mo small model kit or 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 this you know mask it it, it It'll help a lot if you if you just know how to replicate things more in a more natural way. So I'm just gonna basically take this red and and do just that you know model some areas here that look a little bland or they don't look that interesting They're maybe the skin's a little flat needs some dimension or some warmth So in front of, when you're painting in front of yourself and, you, and you're looking at it, you know, again, the, the color should not go on hard like this. You know, the color should not go on, uh, not just the noodling that I'm doing wrong there, but it shouldn't go on harsh. It should go on very soft, you know, very soft build up like this, you know, very, very soft. So build each layer very soft. It should just barely show up, you know. And if you want it to show up more, you know, let's say you get over to here and you're like, well, I want a really nice kind of broken red vein or, or I want this bump here to be more like a zit or accentuated. Okay, you put a little more red on it. Just build, build it up to it. You know, you want a little uh, vein in there, you could come in and, you know, put, put one in there, you know, real tight if you want. But anyway, y you know... Soft and subtle is the key. All right, let's get these cheekbones a little more modeling here. I'm not going to do this all over the entire mask because it will just take forever. And I mean, you could do that, but you know, then I got to go through all the layers again. Of, and that's not really what I'm looking to do here tonight. So let's. Um, it, and actually on the modeling discussion, there's, you know, also being pulled back instead of being super close, you can pull back and do a broader version of what I just spoke about, you know, where you're more pulled back and you're broad, letting more, uh, wider paint out like this. That's another style of modeling more. And that's more in line with the old 80s days of monster modeling skin. You know, back you go look at masks back in the 80s, and a lot of the guys were painting more big blotchy uh, strokes with um, less precise airbrushes, you know, like Pache H airbrushes. And they were using, you know, rubber cement and stuff. And so they'd do these more blotchy, bigger layer of modeling so that you know it looks good it's got a look to it it's got an 80s vibe the golden the golden years of monster horror monsters <laughs> fright night matt mcneil knows what i'm talking about hey casey matt mcneil actually just asked a, a great question and we are collecting a lot of the qa for the second half but uh if you don't mind i'll sneak this one by you go for it all right, Matt asks, you don't use the tip on your airbrush. Is there a reason? Very good question. Very good question. He's got Matt as a keen eye, man. Hmm. He's noticing. 
Um, yeah, so I did take the the end, what he's referring to. If Oh, I don't have it in front of me. Okay, so there's a protective end that goes there, um, uh, right where those threads are. And so I have the needle exposed, as you can see. Well, when you have that, even just that little piece on there to protect the needle, uh, what happens is you're not able to get as tight of a spray uh, and, and a line. When you take that protecting cap off, you can get much closer to your model. I mean, you got to be careful not to bang your needle into, well, masks is not, it can bend still, but like a, if it's a model kit that's a hard surface, you definitely don't want to bang that needle uh, in there. You'll, be, you'll have a bent needle for sure. Um, but, you know, I can get much closer and tighter with that cap removed. And um, let's say some paint builds up on the tip. I can just take my fingernails and wipe it right off. But that's not really the, the, the main reason. <laughs> that's just an extra bonus there to clean the needle. But, yeah, main reason is to get a tighter spray. I mean, I can get in and get hairline type stuff that way. So, anyway, that's, that's what it's for. Great question. Very observant, Mac, Matt McNeil. <laughs> uh, for those of you that don't know Matt, uh, check out his Facebook page uh, because he has been doing these amazing renditions of Fright Night masks, Fright Night monsters, you know, uh, Amy and uh, Evil Ed and, and all that uh, and, and some Lost Boys and things like that. Uh, anyway, he does really, really beautiful uh, renditions of those, and, and uh, you should check that out if you're a fan of those films. Um, they are by far the best renditions I've seen done to date, for sure. Awesome work, Matt. Awesome work. I just so happen to have two Amy's here hmm. that I might be painting. Oh, boy. Not might be. I will be. <laughs> um, anyway. Okay, so, you know, I've reddened this guy up in areas. Nose, cheekbones, here and there. Chin, the chin, I kind of was going to do a little more. Um, I always like to just keep noodling away on these things until, they, until I like them. Now, one cool thing you can do with the red color in your airbrush is you can make up fake things that aren't really on the mask you know, or really sculpted on the mask, unless you happen to find a little bump or something like that. Um, you can do like, let's say some acne or some zits, um, you know, by just putting little red, bright red spots like that. And then we'll come back and put a little white, off white spot with a toothpick or something in, over that red. And it'll look like a real zit, like he's got some acne, pretty cool. Maybe it's a, you know, teenager uh, cyclops, you know. Maybe this is just a teenager. Imagine how big the adult would be then. Uh, anyway, I don't know. But, yeah. So, uh, or he just likes to eat a lot of chocolate and pizza. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that a myth? Chocolate gives you acne? I think it is, yeah. Yeah. It's a bunch of BS. You can have all the Snickers you want. A lot of it just has to do with how clean you're Oh, yeah. Oh, that's gross to think about, yeah. right? Ugh. Eey. Makes me want to wash my sheets. <laughs> All right, so like I said, we could come in here and just say, oh, he's got a little zit there. He's got a little acne over here. You know, whatever. So you can put in these little... And they'll look weird as red spots for, you know, just bright red spots at, at the moment, but... Um, like I said, we can come back through and, and add a little milky white center and that'll make it look like a zit. It'll look like it's really a zit. It's, it's pretty amazing. I put some around his nose too. I think those are going in. Oh yeah, those ones hurt. Remember? Yep. Or, or, uh. Or on his lip. Oh God. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. I have this idea for, it makes me think of this idea I have for a mask, um, called canker head and um 
I don't know if you guys have ever had canker sores, you know, in your mouth. They're pretty disgusting. They're painful as hell, especially if you get one in your throat. Um, but I wanted to do this mask where it's just like it's this weird monster. And no, don't steal this idea, any of you mask makers out there. This is mine. <laughs> uh, anyway, you, I wanted to do this mask where there's all these canker sores just you know, coming off this big bloated lip and this guy's you know looking guy and and then all these canker sores just kind of coming out of his mouth onto his face like spreading <laughs> call it canker head i don't have to do that mask It'd be disgusting i don't know who would want that hanging in their house but the other one we said too where it was just all eyeballs and they were all they all had the yellow crusty stuff Oh, yeah, that's gr that'd be gross. Well, I've had, you know, I've had this idea for years to do a mask based off the Misfits song, 20 Eyes, which would be cool, you know, 20 Eyes. Um, I always loved that song, and I was like, oh, that'd be a great mask, 20 Eyes. But I think someone's already done, like, kind of like a whole bunch of eyes on a mask. In fact, I know that someone did one, and it looked really cool. But it was more of a space monster thing. So, I mean, uh yeah. Anyway, I'm just picking out little areas here that, like, okay, that could be a zit. This could be a zit. And they don't have to be zits. You could even do a to more toned down red, and it could just be a red spot on the skin. You know, it's just a little, little uh, heated red spot or something here and there. So you can do that as well. Uh, sometimes. Oh, you know, the painful ones are on the back of the head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's got painful zit there, painful zit, so. Tonight's stream, how to paint zits on a mask. <laughs> um, anyway, okay, I think that's enough zits or whatever. That'll be enough to, to make the point. All right, so let's uh, get rid of this color. I'm bored with it already. Bored with the reds. Now I do want to do um, another purpley, dark, dark purple red later, but I, I want to show you that's more for uh, broken capillary type things, which we'll put on the nose and things like that. So, but uh, I want to get into some brown tones now and play around with some some extra extra stuff there. Let's see what we got here. And what time are we at now? Oh, we're getting close to... Okay. I just realized I can look at my phone. If only there was a, some technology where I could see the time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, let's see here. Make up some... Now I'm using some Golden and FW. You can intermix color brands just fine, by the way. You know, you don't have to... Uh, stick to uh you know you can you can mix brands of acrylic acrylic's very forgiving that way so okay so now we've got like a red warm red brown here and i'm gonna just put a little touch of water and alcohol not a whole lot just a little bit i don't want to thin this too much Okay, and now I'm going to take this color and do uh, some bigger spots, you know, not like the, not like this, but like bigger little beauty marks or, or little markings, little, uh, it could even be uh, like little uh, spot, age spots, stuff like that. Now, the interesting thing is with this color, this kind of brown too, if you wanted to tone any red areas down that might be a little too much or something, or you want to add some depth, you know, I can come in here and do that in, into the eye. And, you know, so it will tone those things down if you want. But I think the main thing I want to do with this is just put in the beginning signs of some age spots and things so he's not a teenager anymore <laughs> i 
Adults can get acne. <laughs> I always like to put one right on the ear. Yeah, it's cool. You can even have them inside the ear. I know you guys can't really see that too well. There we go. And usually I would do this last. I mean, I might come back and hit it a little darker in the center because we still want to do uh, like a... Um, kind of an over layer to this, but I'm still not done. I think I'm going to put a couple more veining layers here and there before I call it done on the skin. So this might serve as an under undertone spotting type of thing. We'll see. Usually by the time I'm done painting a mask, I've put 12 to 15 colors on I usually use a, quite a quite a lot uh, of different colors painting one mask I usually don't just stick to the same techniques over and over or or, or the same uh, uh, tricks I try to each time I paint one I try uh, very hard to do new things or add more dimension somehow because it's easy to get locked into just doing the same thing over and over again. But I think it's important to uh, try to do it better every time, you know? You'll find tricks that you like and then that you use it to death. And then it also just gets old. Like after a while, you're like, oh, God, I'm bored of that. I got I to gotta do something different. Yeah. Now I'm just going to randomly spot this guy up a little here and there. These are very soft spots, though, like like incredibly soft, barely show up. I'll do a, some tighter ones, maybe forehead, and <clears throat> maybe the brow. Sometimes I'll group them together too, you know, I'll do uh, a group of you know, two, like a bigger one and a smaller one next to it, or just try to break it up, you know, don't keep it, don't do too much of the same sizes keep them different sizes try to make it organic <clears throat> so right there we got a soft big one and a nice tight small one you know right next to each other if you want to add a third you could add a third one you know like a triangle <clears throat> That got a little weird spot on the chin. Get a couple more of these tight ones here and there, about in the back of the neck here. Back of the ear. Why not, right? <clears throat> All right, so he's looking pretty cool now. Nice and spotty and weird. You can even, when you do old age spots, you know, you can mix up a, a brownish color. You can even do grays, like grayish brown tones work really well. Some old age spots are more grayish, you know. Have a gray vibe to them so you can do that too <clears throat> before i get too carried away though i want to make sure that um <clears throat> that we're uh 
I'm not getting too crazy because we got to do a final layer first and I want to show you guys and I want to get a few more uh, things in there but we're going to break for a minute here <clears throat> and do our uh, questions and artist spotlight because it's that time of the night so Mr. Cyclops you're going to chill for a little bit don't need any children while we're gone doing our other thing <clears throat> Sorry, I'm going to get a drink of water, guys. I apologize. I keep having to got a dry throat. <clears throat> All right. So, Ryan, I'm going to – let's take it back to you. And um, uh, actually, hold on, Ryan. I apologize. Let's do Artist Spotlight, and then we'll go into questions. How's that sound? Sounds great. Sounds good. Yeah, sorry about that. I got a little, little off on the track there. Okay, uh, Cyclops, you move there. Let's go here. Now, okay, Artist Spotlight tonight. Tonight, tonight, tonight. This is a good one. This is a good one. I love this one because he's done so many different things. Um, I'm a big fan of um, his monster stuff, uh, but he's actually more well-known for superheroes, uh, which is uh, – in fact, I would call this guy uh, a pioneer of superhero uh, sculpting because – he truly is and i think he was he he brought it to a level um i kind of feel like without his work you wouldn't have the giant uh, uh as many or the giant um statue industry that we have today with superheroes and and all kinds of things monsters and whatnot so without further ado the spotlight tonight <clears throat> is none other than mr randy Bowen Randy's work and this is a piece I have from Randy and uh, this is a, a zombie from a comic zombie comic <clears throat> if you know zombie and um, this is a beautiful statue he did uh, sculpted of zombie and I know Randy had a lot of artists that sculpted for him over the years uh, but he did the majority of the work himself uh, it was all him and uh, you know, you really can't talk about statue history or statues without mentioning Randy Bowen because he was uh, kind of a leader, pretty much the leader and, and pioneer of taking superhero statues to a new level. And uh, especially with collectors and hitting those characters collectors want in their in their um, you know, wanted in their collection. And, and, you know, he hit Spider-Man's. He did. You know, I mean, he did so many Marvel characters, you know, you can list them to death. Punisher, Spider-Man, Daredevil, a Ghost Rider, you know, on and on and on and on and on. I mean, tons. Um, and, but on the side, uh, and even prior to, I think, I believe, he did some, uh, some other things, monster stuff. In fact, I have another statue here. It's a little incomplete. I apologize. But, uh, and, I, and I don't even really have it painted. I'm going to put it up here because it's a favorite of mine that was very inspiring to me. I bought this many years ago. It's broken multiple times on me. I bought this thing many, many moons ago at a, a comic shop in Washington when I used to live up in Washington State for seven years. This was one of the first model kit statues I bought. It was sculpted by Randy. And the, the, the crazy thing is he sculpted this at... Uh, was it Golden Comics or, or Golden Apple Comics down in uh, 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 Melrose? Many years ago, he did a demonstration there. I wish I had known. I'm a guy. I would have loved to be there. And he like sculpted this whole character, from what I understand, pretty much almost to a completion out of Super Sculpey right before everybody's eyes hmm. in, in a demo. Anyway, uh, and then he made this model kit called Jimmy Legs which is such a great demon thing. And it came with a little story book that was awesome and a picture of him sculpting on it. And, you know, he had like one tool and he did it all with like one tool. And it was just amazing to me um, uh, what Randy was able to accomplish, man. It, I mean, his superhero statue career was insane. Uh, you, you, it's immeasurable. It's just so many things. And he's well known for hitting the, the Frank Frazetta on the horse. You know, he was the first guy to do that and do it at such a level that, I mean, that's a, if you've got that statue, it's really never going to be anything that tops it. It's, it's just, uh, it's, 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 it, to me, it's like a piece of statue history. And, um, but yeah, Randy did all these side pieces from time to time, 
that were monsters and, and different things. He did one decapitator and he did, um, I have another model kit called war. I think it is. And it's like a bust of a, of like, a, a, a um, one of the four horsemen. It's amazing. And yeah, it's so cool. I've got it over there hidden. Sam, I'm not going to tell you where no, it is. I <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I love, I love um, the horsemen. Yeah, it's super cool. So, uh, you know, but I, I long ago, I, when I lived in Washington, there was a comic book store, uh, a little north of me, 40 minutes, I used to go to all the time. And uh, the guy always carried Randy's latest stuff. He had a really good connection with Randy and his and his company at the time. And he would get all the new stuff pretty quickly. So I'd always go up there and just see, you know, what the new statues were and, and what's coming out. And he always seemed to have something new from, from Bowen Designs back in the day. So it was very inspiring to see the anatomy and the 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 poses and, and just the raw uh, power that even just a sculpture standing sort of straight like this zombie had, you know, the gestures and, and the things like this, you know, this hand, the way he, he did this hand is just so awesome, you know, the, it just says so much about the character um, right there, you know, that's just such a good lesson right there to give hands just as much life as, as you give the face and, and whatnot. So little, little lessons like that. Things that I would learn just by looking at Randy's work, uh, I, I, I would utilize in my monsters, you know, my monster work. So Randy was uh, really, for me, was a, um, an early inspiration, you know, even this is way before uh, I got into special effects industry, before I got into effects or any of that, I, I was following Randy Bowen's stuff and, and some articles that he did on sculpting and things like that. There were some of them on the internet. I believe he did one even showing like a Boba Fett that was amazing. He's like holding this thing in his hand. I could never understand he's holding this this figure in his hand out of Super Sculpey. And then I read somewhere that he had pre-baked part of it. So that's how he, I was like, how is he holding that in his hand? It's Super Sculpey. I don't get it. And, you know, so you would learn by reading and seeing things like that. So, but yeah, amazing Amazing artist. If you're not familiar with Randy Bowen, uh, Bowen Designs, um, I mean, if you've been to any comic book store, I, I've been to comic book stores till this day, and they still have a few statues of Randy's, or if not, several. And so if you're not familiar with his work, I mean, you should check it out. Um, he's also on Facebook. He's on Instagram. He shares a lot of posts. I got to meet him for the first time at a Jersey Fest show which was amazing. And we got to sit and sculpt together. And that was incredible. I mean, that was just so, for, you know, to sit with someone I had admired for so many years and, but never got to really meet. And he's just such a down to earth, cool guy. And uh, it was a lot of fun to, to sit down and sculpt with someone like that. We're both working in wet clay. I guess he hadn't worked in wet clay yet or, or, had, or, or maybe much at all, but he was really digging it and he was doing some really cool, quick, amazing piece of, out of that. So it was great. Um, I can't say enough about Randy Bowen and Bowen Designs. I mean, the guy just used to bang out piece after piece after piece, just like a just like a machine for years and years and years and years and years. I mean, for for, for several decades or whatever. But he was the industry statue leader for a long time. You know, prior this is prior to sideshow blowing up and prime one and all these other companies that that came after that took everything to a new level and next level and and pushed the the industry further and far and more crazier you know now you've got statues gigantic with all kinds of parts and different heads i mean randy was doing what i would the pioneer work you know that led to all that so yeah uh, amazing sculptor super cool dude um so Definitely, definitely check out his work. And tons of amazing sculptors have worked for him. I mean, Mark Newman, Shiflet Brothers, Joe Mena. I, I'm, I know I'm going to not name them all. I apologize because I don't know every single person to ever work for him. But tons and tons of great artists that now are big time guys all work for Randy and got a launch from him that way too. So here's to Randy Bowen. Thank you for all the years of inspiration, man. You rock. You still rock. Love your stuff. Always will. All right. So, all right, Ryan, let's get to those questions because I'm sure a lot of them have built up at this point. Oh, yeah, buddy. We've got <laughs> quite a few lined up. So, all right, so uh, we'll I'll get to... <laughs> to match you, and we'll, I'll tell you what, just to keep it nice and fair for everybody, 
I've taken note in order of QA received. So what we'll do is we'll start from the top. When Casey needs to get back to the art, he'll let us know. And uh, we'll okay. keep every question that does come in on note so that if we can't get back to you tonight, we will try to take care of you later. Yeah, and we'll try to I'll try to keep the answers short and brief and to the so like you know, so we could try to get through all of them if we can. Okay, let's go for it. All right, buddy, here we go. First question yeah. is from David Felchek. David, thank you for the question. All right. David asks, Casey, in your opinion, what's the difference between a two thousand dollar mask and a hundred dollar mask? <laughs> do you want me to show you because <laughs> uh, i can show you well i don't have a two thousand i don't have one of my two thousand dollar masks on hand i i never have any of those because they're always sold um or you know I've, someone bought them okay so if we're talking okay so first of all anything that's two thousand dollars to me in my mind is no longer i would call a mask yes it's made of latex, uh, like guys like me, Jordu, uh, Norman Cabrera, Steve Wang. We all have done these really uh, crazy masks that cost two, three thousand. I've done ones that cost five to six thousand. I've actually got a few, but you know, you only sell a few of those if you're lucky. Because uh, who can afford a five thousand dollar mask? I mean, a millionaire. That's basically who. Uh, anyhow, the, the the difference is. A lot, and I and and I try very hard as 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 I as I know Jordu did. And and speaking of pioneers, I'm going to give this credit because this really does belong to Jordu. Jordu is the pioneer of taking masks to that level, to an art level, to a level of this is a piece of art. This is not a novelty item anymore. A hundred dollar mask um, is your run of the mills you know you're you're you and you've got levels you've got desk studios those are your hundred dollar range and they're beautiful masks they're very nicely made uh what jeff gives you for 80 to 100 bucks is incredible especially still in this day and age i mean he could be charging easy 125 or 150 for those masks and still selling a ton of them but uh, but but uh because the time put in is there i mean you know it, it shows the quality is there um then you've got be something studios another american made mask company but their masks go uh, you know well on average their masks are a little lower end but they do have some hundreds and, and even higher if you want to custom but you know their average what 50 60 70 bucks and then you've got trick-or-treat studios again all really beautifully made uh masks vision holes so you can see out of them wear them all that kind of stuff uh, although jeff does offer collectible copies without holes the difference though is uh, and th and I, I don't want this to ever come off as I'm knocking anyone down or anything like that. Those guys are trying to sell as many masks as possible. Those guys are mass producing masks on a mass production level. There are many, many multiple molds made, if not hundreds of molds over years. Uh, the, the castings, you know, hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of castings of the same thing. Um, when you come to a guy like me, Jordu, Norma Cabrera... Steve Wang or something like that, you are paying for something that maybe one of seven people in the world own. Or, I mean, because I don't create, you know, uh, hundreds of these things. Uh, I mean, hundreds across the board with like all different masks, you know, not thousands, but what every one particular mask I make, there's probably only. Uh, if it's say it's a six hundred seven hundred dollar mask, I mean they're probably only going to be seven, eight, ten copies max out in in the in the world, unless it's a super hit like my swine, which was this pig man thing I did, which you know I sold twenty five, thirty of those things out there probably, uh, and that's rare, you know. Um, so you're paying for really a one of a kind piece of art because every mask I paint, even if it's it's the same one again or the same paint job, it's somehow different each one is different each one is unique each one has a look to it you're basically paying that artist for for a one-of-a-kind piece and they're spending hours if not days making that thing not a couple hours not casting it seemed it's already seamed and in paint and, and slap a paint job on in an hour or two or whatever no i'm spending four days solid time you know eight hours here and there you know uh, or three hours here four hours there five hours here three hours here back and forth, you know, uh, 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 painting these things. I mean, here I'm doing it as quick as I can in front of you guys, but normally I would be taking way more time, you know, doing these. And um, 
So when you add up the sculpting time, which is can be several weeks or longer or, or full days or whatever, and then the mold making, and then there's only one mold usually ever, ever in existence. With me, there's only usually ever one mold. Uh, it's however many castings can come out of that mold. And again, I only could probably sell, you know, so many. And then uh, by the time you add up all that time, if you were to do that hourly and you were to charge a hundred bucks, you would make nothing. You, you, you'd be, you'd, you'd never make a dime. So, you know, these masks, are really pieces of art in latex and that's why we cast them thick sometimes foam fill them paint the hell out of them make them look as realistic as possible crazy eyes crazy details as real as possible sometimes crazy extended parts and weird things and customized things and when you get into that level punched hair when you start getting into there i mean a punched hair job in the effects industry is four to five thousand dollars so for us to put a punched hair job on a two thousand dollar mask at twenty five or twenty nine hundred dollars or three thousand, you're getting an extraordinary deal because if you go in the effects industry, some hair person that punches hair, they'll charge you you know easily four grand to do a head. But you know we'll do a mask for twenty five hundred that has a four thousand dollar hair job on. It's like it, with real punched hair, it's it's you know you have to consider. It's like it's no different than a painter that paints a beautiful one of a kind piece and sells it to you for $9,000 or whatever. I mean, a mask it's because it has the following of the Halloween industry, the novelty following that it, it tends to lose and not have as high of a value threshold as a painting or something like that. But to me, it's a remarkable piece of art. It's three dimensional. And when we paint them, like what I'm showing you now on this death studios mask, I mean, again, it's, hours and hours of labor and time that you have to consider and that's really I'm, i know i'm rambling here but that's that's the difference between a two thousand dollar mask and a hundred dollar mask i mean you know and and look at them side by side there's just no comparison ever i mean you know uh you you, you take one of mine or jordu or steve or norman whoever you want to name and you put it next to a mass produced mask they're not gonna it's it's like worlds of difference um in those masks Anyway, that's all I'm going to go. I was very long-winded. I apologize. I told you I'd keep them short, but I can't keep that answer short. There's just no way. <laughs> okay. Well, I was going to say, Casey, tell us how you really feel. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm pa I'm pa and I, and I and I don't mean it to come across wrong. I'm pa listen, I love all masks. I collect mass produced and everything. I collect trick or treat, I collect uh, be something. Be something is one of the things that inspired me. I collect all of them. Oh, Death Studios, yeah. but the the truth is, you know, I'm real passionate about that topic. Because, and I know other mask guys are too, because the truth is, you know, when if like just take an average artist rate in the industry, you know, 35, 40 an hour, add that up over hours, you know, with time, and you'll see. I mean, it's, you know, even what we charge sometimes it's, it's, uh, it's hard to justify, but you, there's a threshold where, you know, it gets to be too expensive and then you're just pricing yourself out of the market altogether. I mean, you can only, you can't expect everyone to afford two thousand dollar masks all day long. So I try to do. If you look at what I do, I try to do anything from three hundred on up. You know, to those big five thousand dollar masks. I only, I never really do. I haven't done a five thousand dollar mask in a while, but I have done some recently twelve hundred, thirteen hundred masks, and and then even resin busts. You know, that are thirteen hundred, fourteen hundred dollars. And uh, yeah, so all right, that's it. Right. Right. <laughs> Well, well said, Casey. Right on. I think, uh, you know, that, that they got the point. No. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Uh, Casey, next question is from Jace, uh, excuse me, Jesse Aarons. Jesse, cool. Thank you for the question. All right. Jesse asks, how does PAX paint hold up on a latex mask over many years as opposed to latex or rubber cement paint? That or bloodline paints, et cetera. Uh, well, I mean, PAX paint holds up the same as anything over many, many years. Um, I've been, I've switched to PAX back in the early Monster Palooza days. I mean, so it's been, geez, 2008 or nine, you know, uh, or longer. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, rubber cement's great, but it's toxic as hell. You know, rubber cement has benzene in it and all kinds of other stuff. And then you thin it with naphtha. I mean, it looks great. And if you are going to do the rubber cement thing, I mean, just brush it on. Don't airbrush it because that's when you introduce more chemicals into the air or wear a respirator, do it outside, you know, protect yourself. It's nasty stuff. 
but I stopped doing rubber cement. Um, actually, too, I'm always, I've always been a little weary about rubber cement because it's known that oil uh, rots latex, right? And you're putting oil-based paints into rubber cement. Now, yes, you're making it dry instantly by adding all this naphtha to it. But I've always thought, like, God, it kind of goes against, like, the golden rule of mass. Like, it, you know, it, oil rots masks. You know, water, oil, sun, those are, those are bad for latex masks. But it's weird, I guess. I mean, I've never seen evidence of it attacking a mask. Uh, you know, all the ones I've done, I've I actually did see some twenty, almost twenty year old masks at a friend's house, and they were like as fresh as the day I pulled them out of the mow. I couldn't believe it. And uh, you know, he kept them in a case and kept them nice, but out of sunlight. But uh, they were like amazing, and those were painted with with oil. So I guess it doesn't affect it. But I always thought it was so counter. Uh, what, what are you like counter? counter counterintuitive kind of thing yeah because it's like you're putting a, a, a material that has something in it that could rot latex but i think it's because the naphtha makes it instantly dry on the surface that it doesn't have time to and once it's dry that's it the the, the oil doesn't attack so anyway um, the long the short answer here pa packs and 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 all that it, it holds up just fine it's not temporary it's it's permanent and it, i mean it sticks like majorly well to latex it's really aggressive glue so um yeah no worries there um what was the other thing he was asking something else ryan am i missing oh sure yeah he he asked uh, uh let's see packs hold up on latex mass over the years as opposed to latex or rubber cement that or the bloodline paint. oh bloodline well bloodline paint is just acrylic it's not even a it's not there's nothing in bloodline paints that makes it stick to latex um, uh, bloodlines are really awesome paints that my buddy Tim Gore does with uh, Createx. Those are great paints, uh, beautiful to use on masks, um, for sure. Uh, but they don't have anything inside that you would like go right on a mask, but they do make their own mask adhesive. Uh, I forget what it's called. There's an adhesive they do make that you can put on a mask and then use bloodlines over top. It's kind of the same sort of idea it's different than packs the, the thing i like about packs and, and i tell everybody this it's lot it's a lot like rubber cement if you wanted to spray it on uh and i know a lot of people are scared to death of that because it's like it's it, it's well known that packs glue paint doesn't spray through airbrush as well it clogs really crazy but i've actually done a lot of tricks with it very thinned out with alcohol and when you put alcohol in it you know water so you thin it with water and then alcohol and I can do a translucent base coat over a mask. I mean, we should probably do a demo of that on here one day. And I can show you guys how I do that. But it makes, I've made masks look like silicone. In fact, I fooled, I fooled effects artists and, ma I mean, major effects people with this. And showed them and they're, and is that, is that silicone? It's like, no, it's latex. Oh my God, you know, it looks like silicone. But you got to be, you got to do it right away when the mask is freshly pulled. So it doesn't start aging too much. And you got to do... You know, it takes layers of doing it and all this stuff. Um, so it's amazing. You can thin it and spray it. Um, uh, you know, whereas this mask I'm showing you, I just brushed it on opaque. But there's other tricks you can do with packs that that you can also do that are that I used to do with rubber cement. And um, but you, I find you can't do with other glues and other things. You know, so it's got some advantages, is what I'm saying. So anyway, that's it. I mean, it's it holds up great. Awesome. Adhesion, Adhesion promoter. Yes, that's the that's the stuff that uh, Tim Gore's line has available for masks. We used it on a video Stan Winston thing once, and but I and, and I and it was good. It, it worked great. Uh, but but um, I think I tried thinning it because it got thick on me and it didn't work. So I don't think it can be thin. But maybe Tim knows better than me. I don't want to say put anything out there that that's not true. I haven't worked with it enough to know. Tim would know better. So if you have questions re regarding the adhesion promoter or Tim's paints, Tim, he's the man to ask on that for sure. All right. Thanks, Casey. We've got about 10 or 11 more questions here. All right. We, uh, let's see. Next up is Jerry PF. Jerry, thank you for the question. All right. Jerry asks, you don't seal between layers because of the material or the scale. Uh, I don't seal between layers mainly because I just don't find it necessary. I'm never trying to um, uh, 
that because that most of the people I know that do that, or if I do it on, I, I okay, I do it on statue stuff from time to time, you know. Um, but I don't have to worry about that being flexible. But mainly, I'd say the main reason is flexibility, right? Like I still want some nice flexibility at the end of the mask, uh, not because I'm going to wear it. I mean, it's being done as a display piece, you know. But if you did want to wear it, you know, you want to keep it flexible as possible. Um, and if I was going, by the way, if I was going to make this a wearable mask, you know, for, like I knew someone was going to wear, I would be doing more painting with PAX layers. I would have done the first few layers with PAX and and then started in just going to airbrush uh, uh, alcohol based paints. But let's back up here. So basically, I don't uh, seal because I just don't find it necessary. And two, you're then you're adding you're adding extra layer of sealer that you just don't need. In the end, I do all the sealing. Uh, when I'm finished with the paint job and that's really it and I mean it, it's really just about that like keeping keeping it as thin as possible going on so that in the end it's it's got still some nice flexibility to it and 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 that so, so the paint's not cracking and whatnot so uh yeah that's really it um uh and a good trick like I said is to do the first few layers in packs you can do that you can add just a little the thing about packs which is great is it's non toxic it's super it's harmless it's not going to hurt you it's very sticky though like contact cement and but you can do layers and you can even do by the way i should explain this to people you can even i've done this before if you feel like the mask is getting too rigid and you don't you go oh i'm losing some flexibility i can tell or the, or oh i'm seeing a paint might crack a little uh if i flex it too far well you can brush a layer if you want a protective layer you can actually brush a thin layer of packs over the whole mask and it'll just be totally sticky and then continue the rest you go and continue more layers from there and the alcohol layers as you're adding and whatnot will get rid of the, most of the stickiness but uh ultimately by the time you seal the mask all the stickiness will be gone anyway but that's another technique that eventually maybe i'll show on here so there's so many things you can do with it and that's why it's expensive and i know people don't like that about packs glue it's not cheap but it's worth it all right, thanks, Casey. We've got uh, the next question from Ashley Bosworth, and I want to throw out a special shout out, Casey, that she just posted her first mask on the Facebook uh, Monday Night Monster Jam. Rad. So everyone should definitely check it out. It's super awesome. Ashley, awesome. Congrats on your mask. Uh, we'll check that out later when I get uh, get done with the stream. I love to see it. Uh, thank you for the question. All right, Ashley asks, what brand of paint are you using? Oh. Okay, so tonight I'm using several brands. I'm using Golden Acrylics. Golden is a is a well-known established paint line. I'm using Badger Freak Flex by Badger. I'm using some FW acrylic inks, um, which you'll find a lot of mask makers love. Tonight I will probably be using some of these, uh, which is something new to introduce to you guys, these Quick Shades uh, by Army Painter, Quick Shades. And I have other shades here by Citadel. So, yeah, just, uh, you know, just grabbed whatever and just using that. But all acrylic based. All these can be intermixed, no problem, and, and, um, and thinned as well. So, yeah, all acrylics. So if you're looking for those, uh, some you can get in local stores, some you have to order. You know, our major art stores um, will carry some of these, like Golden and FW. The Freak Flex you probably have to order, and Citadels you can get at gaming stores, and I think Army Painters you can get at miniature gaming stores. Uh, if not, you can order online. All right, thank you, Casey. Once again, we've got. Oh, we're looking at. Oh, we're, sorry. Sorry, we're looking at her mask right now. That's cool. It's like a demon. Oh, oh nice yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. Good job. That looks great. I love the demon. It's creepy. Yeah, nice paints on the skin too. By the way. Okay, sorry, Ryan. Go for it. <laughs> All right, All right, Casey, we've got for the next question, we have the Grave Diggers Workshop. Oh, thank you, Grave Diggers work Workshop, I, whoever you are, and thanks for the question. All right. They ask, is it possible to achieve these results with brushes only? For those of us who hate airbrushing, thanks for sharing your techniques, Casey. You know what? Yes, actually, you can. You just need to get used to thinning the paints to work the right way for you. I mean, sponging is obviously a great one. Brush work is a great one by doing washes. And um, 
but yes, you can, and you can do it with packs. You can mix it with a. That was one thing I was going to say earlier. You can mix small amounts of Pax glue into paint colors and then thin with water, and it'll still be tacky because Pax can actually be thinned out very far and still be very tenacious and tacky. So the great thing is, if you want a nice flexible mask and you want to do all your layers and with brushes, you could you could do that. Um, but you can also just do it without the packs after, you know, just do the base coat with packs and then go and do all your layers. But yeah, you can achieve a lot with just brush techniques and, and hand techniques and sponges and sea sponges and and all that. You can achieve a very realistic paint job that way. Um, the airbrushing, though, is I do feel it's a necessity. I know some other guys that didn't want to ever get into an airbrush or get into it. But once they got used to it and using it, it did become another tool. It, it's it's part of the the it's part of your tool set as a painter. And the the beauty of an airbrush is the soft uh, uh, looks that you can get, and and how fine you can get, uh, and how soft and fine you can get at the same time with it. It gives a certain layer to the mask that you just can't get with as well uh, with brushwork and, and sponge. I mean, you could still achieve great things with that. You don't need an airbrush, but um, the, the one thing an airbrush also does for you is it speeds up the paint job. It's fast. You know, once you get used to it and it becomes like your, like your hand, your second nature, um, yeah, if I had to do it all by hand, you know, and get the softness and the blend, you have to sit there and blend with a brush and do all that, um, it just wouldn't be as quick, you know, you'd spend a lot more time painting your pieces, um, that way, but you know, then again, you can get amazing results that way. So I, I use a combination of things, but so I would highly recommend at least having one airbrush, but Hey, you know, it's not for everybody. Some people just don't like them. They just can't get used to them anyway. Yeah, no, you could, I've seen some amazing stuff, uh, with no airbrush. In fact, I taught classes where we didn't even use airbrush. <laughs> so. Cool. All right. Here we go. Good stuff. We've got next question from Chris Dawson. Chris, thanks for the question. All right. Chris asks, do you have a preferred methods for applying hair or maybe even eyelashes to latex masks? Well, uh, Chris, I try not to do that work. <laughs> My wife does most of it for me when I need it done. Um, I'm okay at like gluing it down. Punching I can do but I'm just not that great at it. Um, eyelashes, I've never tried. I've never done. I've done nose hairs. I've done ear hairs. <laughs> uh, eyelashes, let me think. My wife, No, eyebrows are tough too. Eyebrows are tricky. But my wife is usually one that's done those techniques, you know, the punching and all that. Punching latex is, is a tricky thing too because latex is not like silicone. It's it's stiffer, and when it's thick, it's harder to get through. You need very strong needles, but very small, strong needles. And, you know, uh, we use one trick I can tell you that is, a, that is a major helpful thing and actually totally necessary for latex, I think, is when my wife w would punch each hair after four or five hairs of punching, she would dip the needle, the, which we custom cut and make, um, she would dip it in, uh, silicone fluid. It's like a silicone oil or silicone fluid for silicone work. You can buy it from special effects supplies. It's a lubricant, basically an oil, but it's not oil based like, you know, like, like oil, uh, uh, like we were talking about the tax latex This is silicone based. So it's harm, harmless to latex. So. Uh, but it does lubricate the needle so that when you're going through the latex, it makes it easier to get get it through all the way. Um, so she would dip it every once in a while and punch four or five hairs, dip it, punch, 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 dip it. So that's one trick. The other thing is keep in mind with hair, the tricky thing is growth, how it grows, you know, going at the right angle. Otherwise, the hair will tend to stick out weird, you know. So like you, if you're coming down, you need to, you need to not only punch at the right angle but you need to punch the way the hair grows so you got to kind of study how hair grows and i'm no expert at that i can't give you like tips for that 
Eyelashes, again, probably one of the trickiest, man. I would say this, though. There are plenty of um, special effects uh, people. Michelle Nairi comes to mind. And uh, who's the other one? Uh, Hair Punch Girl. Look up Hair Punch Girl on Instagram. She's a special effects uh, professional hair punch lady um, from the effects industry. And... Um, amazing work and and they do show videos a uh, little sometimes videos of them punching eyelashes and punching hair and you can pick up a lot just by watching those even though they're not really telling you what they're doing you can just pick up the technique and see how they're uh handling stuff like that that's the best i can give you there other than trial and error grab a latex mask without paint on it and punch some and try and try it and see what your results are and learn because the, there's no better way to figure it out than just trying it and doing it you know scrap maybe you have a scrap eyeball with a with a you know the lid and you just punch punch some hairs and see what what works you know yeah thank you casey we've got the next question from freddie nail freddie thanks for the question all right freddie asks do the freak flex still have that satin sheen as the old ones uh no they don't. They change the formula, you know. Um, the formula is different. There are a few colors that do come in a matte and a gloss. I believe sunburn red or whatever that was has a glossy version and then a matte. But um, no, um, they're different, you know. And the, I remember the old bottles in the little jars and not the jar, but the little plastic looking and they you know the paint would stick in the cup and you couldn't clean it out well and you, i i tried thinning with water and alcohol and it never worked the paint was just had a totally different body the paints are thinner now though i'll say that they're thinner than they used to be and the formulas just like my casey love badger formula that i use on masks and stuff so yeah whatever happened to them that changed them and now they come in these bottles up by the way too the colors all seem to be about correct and the same as what they used to be but no they're different different uh different body so yeah i highly recommend them though they're great all right thanks casey once again we've got matt cable all right matt thanks for the question all right matt asks casey do you ever use dry brushing on masks yes Yes, 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 yes. Uh, of course. Um, you know, on this particular guy tonight, no. Um, but I have used it quite a lot in the past. Um, there are some tricks. Let's say I had a mask um, with a real crazy texture, dragon scales or lots of scales or bumps and lumps or things like that. I might sometimes base coat that mask in let's say it's a lizard man or something let's just kind of go along with me here imagination let's say I have a lizard man he's got all these scales and bumps and things so i might base him green like a bright lime green or or a grayish lime green or something and then i would go in and give it a glaze or a wash in and bring all the the texture out like we talked about last week and then kind of take paper towels and wipe that down so it's all in the cracks and then I'll take the original base color and then dry brush over top of all that. And that sets you up for like a really nice uh, um, quick three steps, you know, base coat, wash, dry brush, or glaze. I, I usually glaze, not, not wash, but you can do whatever works. Anyway, that sets you up right away for a nice run to the finish line with three quick, easy steps. And it brings everything to life. you got your deeps. Uh, done and then you've got your highlights done and and also when you dry brush over a mask if you use a chip brush and you just lightly dry brush and dry brush and build it up um, it also kind of helps knock down a little bit of what's in the cracks a little here and there and, and it looks really nice and ready to go and then from there you can just start doing all your thin cool layers and things that you want to put on there i wish i had an example uh to show you but i just don't i'm looking around i don't i don't have one on hand so hey but that's a technique and a thing we can definitely get to i have a mask up above that does use that tech those techniques and i will promise you guys i'll showcase that on a paint job here that'll just become another lesson like how to handle scales and and all that and, and glazes and dry brushing we'll do all that 
So thank you for the question because you just gave me a whole new idea for a new lesson. <laughs> All righty. We've got uh, Casey. The next question is from Jason Wilwright. Jason, thanks for the question. All right. Jason asks, what do you thin your paints with? Water first. It, well, it depends. If I'm airbrushing and I want to thin paint, uh, water first, just straight water. And then I follow that up with alcohol and 99% alcohol. You can use alcohol such as 91, 92, 93, whatever, 95, 97, whatever you can get your hands on. You don't need 99. Uh, 70% not gonna work for that. I mean, 70% you can use for other things, but um, not for the purposes I'm using it for, which is to get the, make the paint dry on the surface immediately so I can build up veins and layers and layers and layers. So the water, is used to just thin the paint, the body of the paint out, the pigmented paint, the air, the acrylic. Even though it's airbrushable, that doesn't mean it's thin enough, right? So, it, so some of these paints like white and black, they're harder to thin down. So, you know, you need to add some water first to get the, because water will, you, these are water-based paints, so they accept water nicely, that thins the paint out nicely for you. And then you follow up with alcohol, knowing that the paint can accept that and deal with it and not get all you know, crog, what do you call it? Coagulated, coagulated or, yeah. you know, right. it gets all gross on you and weird and clogs up your airbrush. So yeah, you just got to thin the paint out with, with water first, then alcohol. And you can use any of the 90% range and it'll work just fine. You know, um, and I think that's about it. Oh, you can use uh, denatured alcohol too, if you prefer. The denatured works as well. So in fact, denatured alcohol is less, aggressive in the paint so it works really well um but i think it's more fumey i think it's not as good for you okay cool thank you casey we've got next up from dom draven dom thanks for the question all right dom draven asks this is off topic but do you have any advice for any artist who are trying to build an audience i'm a novice sculptor mm, yeah well uh dom i mean back when i started there was no social media. The social media, well, there was sort of just in a very underground way, right? Because back in the day that I started building my name, um, really all there was was trade shows like, you know, Wonderfest for model kits. Uh, and then came along years later, Mask Fest, Monster Palooza at the same time, and shows like that. And that's always a great way. Shows are a great way to get your name out there, to get your face out there. But this day and age, man, you 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 know, all you younger guys and all you new guys, you have you have a big advantage. You have social media, you have Facebook, you have Twitter, you have Instagram, you have YouTube, you have all these things at your 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 fingertips. So when you need to sell yourself, get your name out there, make people know who you are, the sky's the limit. You know, you just need to uh, build your portfolio up a little bit, you know, if you if it's not so strong yet or whatever, or you're, as you're learning or as you're going. A lot of people love to see people progress, you know. They love to see people go from A to Z, you know, like, oh, my God, when this guy started two years ago, he wasn't so good, but now look at him. So that's fun for you to follow to and see because it's exciting to see your progress over years. So I can't stress to you and don't worry about how many followers you have and this and that and all that it, it, everyone gets caught up in that and, and i'm guilty of it as well i mean everybody gets caught up in that but don't worry about that as a new guy uh, or novice or whatever just don't worry about it just keep putting your stuff out there keep feeding it out there uh um and and build a following an event and and over time you will you know if you're on facebook if you're on instagram and you're constantly posting new stuff and trying new stuff and showing new art it's just going to go upward you can't you're not going to go down you're going to go up always up so just keep doing that and before you know it everyone will know who you are <laughs> so it's it's that simple man you just got to keep at it and keep progressing and keep going to the next level and keep, you're going to hit plateaus that's fine everyone does uh, I hit them still, you know, it's okay. And then you got to find a way to jump to that next level and then jump to the next level and push to the next level. So, uh, but never give up. Just keep going, man. Just keep driving forward no matter what. And you'll get where you want to go. Thank you, Casey. We can all learn from that wisdom, man. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. We've got next question from David Felchuk. David, thank you for the question. 
All righty. David asks, Casey, is there reference material for skin diseases or rotting flesh that you would recommend? <laughs> <laughs> well, go dig people up. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, no. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, well, there are actually some creepy reference things out there you can look into, such as medical books. Uh, and they get quite disturbing. I have a few that I almost really don't even like looking at because they're deformities, you know, babies that are deformed and things. And really, it's, it's you know, and I don't like to take from those too much because it i don't know there's something about that's a real thing and man that just feels wrong to do and utilize and again i mean it's it's life it's inspiration and animals have deformities we all take from that so if i do i try to tweak it into something of my own somehow but there are medical books you know, geriatrics, medical style books and things. There's disease medical books on diseases and things. And you can see some pretty gnarly stuff, you know, people with holes in their skin and pretty gnarly uh, stuff. But, you know, and it's very, when you get it in color, it's great because if you're going to paint, you know, you can see, it's amazing to see what nature offers as a paint palette sometimes, you know, um, the, I always laugh when um, you get an, uh, an artist. I've heard this before. You get an artist teacher or an art teacher that says, oh, there's no black in nature and there's no white in nature or there's no this in nature. You don't find that in nature. It's like, really? You don't? Because I just looked at a frog that has black ass patterns all over it. I mean, up, black is black. Look up in the sky at night. like. Yeah. Oh, I, no. Yeah. All colors. Now, you know, you could argue black's not a color, of course, but... No, there's like it's it's out there, man. I mean, red eye tree frogs, you know, they have look at the colors on that. Look at the, you know, so to me, um, looking at nature and real life is part of the big key to practicing, you know, your craft, and especially if you are focused on having some sort of realism in there. Um, you have to look at nature, you know, you can't ignore it. Nature is the key. So, um, but yeah, there are these books. I've, I have a few, I don't know where they are right off hand. They're buried away, but, um, uh, in a vault, no, <laughs> uh, no, they're buried away. And I, I don't think I can get to any of them currently. Um, maybe I'll try to share them on one of the streams, but they are kind of disturbing. They're kind of creepy, but yeah, I mean, there's like, you know, cause you'll see an old lady and the poor old lady has this weird, a goiter on her neck or this weird pustule thing in her forehead or i've seen where people have come like cancer and it's eaten away their half their face and it's like oh my god it's it's grotesque you know it's hard to look at too so at the same time it's kind of disturbing you know but that stuff serves as good reference you can look up stuff on your phone and look up, just to search it man you know, it's not going to take you long to run into some nasty stuff if you're searching for the right keywords you know um, so there's the internet's free for you to look up things like that. Um, yeah. And uh, I'm trying to think, you know, a, a lot of times too, interestingly enough, I can be inspired, uh, you know, let's say you're doing a zombie or something and you want something a little fresh take on, I mean, you can get inspired just by, I, I get this way. You can get inspired just by seeing color, you know, just colors next to colors in nature, you know, I don't know, leaves and animals and different things. I mean, sometimes you'll just see a combination of things working together that just looks amazing. You know, you'll have, uh, uh some frog belly, uh, off white skin with some hyper red veins and then purples and nasty blues all blending together. Even though the thing's a living creature, there's just a, a weird combination of colors working in its skin in a translucent way that looks gnarly. And you can apply that to zombies and things and different characters and it works amazing. So I just color referencing things works too. So, yeah. All right, Casey, we are in the home stretch, sir. Oh, my God, good, because we're almost done with this live stream. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got no, okay. the final two, and I think we've got a great one for the uh, last question here. Okay. Uh, uh, second to last year, we've got Collier Wilms. Collier, thank, for the, thank you for the question. All right, my man, Collier asks, 
maybe off topic, but I'm curious about how Casey goes about patching a mask. Patching a mask. So holes and problem areas, right? Things like that. Teeth, things like that. Um, I think that's what he's talking about. I don't know if he's pat talking about patching the seam or whatever he's talking about. But um, that's another reason to have PAX glue. or not. I, we keep calling it PAX. PAX is a terminology that Dick Smith made up, which means acrylic and prosade together, by the way. I'm just, so in case you were wondering, it's something that Dick Smith developed and came up with. The glue is just called prosade, and you want original, just original, old-fashioned prosade glue, which is a milky white glue. Um, so prosade um, and cabasil. Now, you know, I'm going to mention cabasil here. I'm going to have to stress caution to the wind and caution to you guys that aren't familiar with it because it's a very, uh, it can be very harmful to you if you ingest it. Uh, which you, it's very easy to do. You don't want to do. Uh, so be smart. Do it again. Use It's not a chemical or anything, but what, what it is, is Cabasil is a ground glass <laughs> so finely ground up that it just lightly floats in the air like nothing. And, and it literally floats in the air. And it's just fine, fine ground up glass that, you know, you can't, you ingest a shitload of that into your lungs and you're done for. So you... <laughs> Again, everything in effects wants to kill you. you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so just be mindful what you're doing. Um, you know, you don't want to take a cup of cabastil and just dump it into something and watch it float in the air everywhere and breathe it in. So again, but what cabastil does is it thickens, right? It, when you add a little tiny bit to these liquids, it makes it thick, and you can get it stuff to be like thick, like peanut butter. And so you can do that with prosade. You can make prosade as thick as peanut butter in seconds with packs, you know, just mixing it in. Um, and you can even add a little latex in there while you're at it. But um, when I usually patch a mask, to be honest with you these days, because I like to avoid all the chemicals and the weird stuff like that, um, I use the back of a, a, a lot of times I use the back tip of a paintbrush. If it's, if it's holes, you know, like a hole in the mask or a tooth has a hole in the tip or something, I, I'll build up just straight latex until I get it built up. You know, uh, um, you can also hair dry it to speed it up, whatever, but I'll build it up. Uh, and then when I get to the right build up, like a little bit more than what I need, you know, especially if I'm shaping a fang or something like that, then what I'll do is I take a, a burner tool and I'll have to show you guys which one I use. I take a burner and I do this outside again, outside with a burner, you burn latex, it's not good outside. for you to breathe. Yes. Burning <laughs> rubber is it's not terrible. good. It's terrible for your for don't breathe burnt rubber and it will stink up your studio to high. Don't even try it. <laughs> but do it outside and you burn I'll burn down back and 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 reblend it burning it, you know, blend it blend it blend it with the burner. Don't burn yourself too. You got it's freaking hot. And <laughs> Uh, and then I'll use naphtha a little bit on a brush to blend and clean off. It really cleans the area off really well and, and, and helps smooth it out. So then uh, that's it. And that's how I really fix things, you know, uh, with burner tools and, and, uh, pa and patching with latex. That's the way I do it. Now, some people take, you know, cabasil mixed with prosade and they go over the seam line and, and they re texture and redetail in and all that and you could do it that way too it's more of a process but you can do that too but i burn my seams and all that too so yeah it's something we'll have to try to get in. i don't know how we would do it here because you can't do it in a closed garage so it's just too smelly but anyway that's how i fix problems man build it up with latex burn it down clean it with naphtha that's really it all right, Casey. Thanks once again. We've got for our last question. We're going to kick off new hashtag Casey Love World. All right. Uh, this last question, Casey, is from Magneto Creations. Magneto, don't bend any metal on me, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cool name, All Magneto. Right. Thank you for the question. All righty. Magneto asks: In one of the episodes, Casey was working and said that the most important part of a piece was the story. Do you have a Casey Love World? Were your creations in your head? Where are they set in the real world? Um, I, I, you know, um, I don't know if I have a story where like all these monsters fit into one world or anything like that. I just think they, 
stem from um, things from my childhood or things that inspire me that I see, you know, like I said earlier, colors, I can see for some weird reason, sometimes I can just see a combination of colors and I can actually spawn a whole monster in my head. Sometimes I'm just thinking about weird stuff or sometimes I just see shapes and then see a monster in there or something. And, um, and, but I don't know that I wouldn't say that they all fit into a world. But I do tend to, as an artist, get locked into um, v- uh, vibes. Uh, so I can, for uh, during Halloween time, typically I'm in a boogeyman vibe, you know, or boogity monster mask vibe, and I want to make something creepy and 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 cool and interesting all at the same time. And then other parts of the year, I'm in a fantasy vibe, and all of a sudden I want to make trolls and and ogres and fantasy type things orcs and whatever and in other parts of the year i'm listening to slayer and i want to make demons and satanic looking things and then other times of the year i want to make aliens and sci-fi stuff i guess i just get in these vibes and when i'm in the zone that zone uh i can stay in it for a short period of time and sometimes i stay in it for a long period of time um and it's I don't know. I just get into those modes, you know, and when I get in those modes, that's just where I'm going. And, but I don't necessarily feel like they all fit into one world. I, I did hear from, um, Chet Zar, uh, not too long ago. Or I read, sorry, Chet Zar was saying that he felt like he was almost building with his creations, his paintings. And so he's almost building an entire world of characters that all fit into one. And I could totally see that because they do look like, they all could fit into this one world and and because they all have um a, a look to them that makes them do that but i think i've because i've i've always strived to um make every mask i do completely different from the last or the next that um i think they don't fit together <laughs> well uh, but i've done tables at Monster Palooza, where they all are a vi- like a, I've done a fantasy table one year, you know, I had dragons and 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 monsters, you know, trolls and giants and things. They all all went together, and then one year I did like aliens, and so, I, you know, there's that. I but I and I don't know. I'm even answering your question correctly here. I'm just trying to think, you know, how I think and how I work. But uh, yeah, I just tend to get into these modes, and it's like that's what I got to make. You know, lately I've been thinking about this new uh, Innsmouth fishman mask that has these really like pulled out eye sockets and is really weird and freaky looking i keep it keeps popping in my head so i don't know and sometimes um there'll be an idea of 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 something that pops in my head for years you know and i keep having the same idea like oh that'd be cool oh that'd be cool and i'll forget about it for months on end oh that'll be cool and i'll forget about it for more and then next thing you know like two years later i'll go and go i gotta make that mask (laughs) So I go make it, but I just work in weird ways like that. And maybe that's the way a lot of artists work. And I think my, it's weird, but I don't know. So how, yeah, I guess, how do you work? How do you, how does, how's your mind work? I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know I'm answering his question at this point. I'm sorry. I'm just thinking. Yeah, but no, I don't have anything where everything fits together in a world, I guess. Is that it? Right, Ryan? Is that kind of what he's asking? That's exactly it, Casey. You nailed it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, when you look at my work, you could see it's pig people, monsters, and then cyclopses. Well, I do, I do do a lot of cyclopses, but again, each one is so different than the rest. You know, than than, than the others. I mean, so I don't even think they fit together, and in, in, in maybe some do and some don't. But it's weird. Um, I've always wanted to do a movie of just cy- a planet of cyclopses. <laughs> be cool is that uh is that our last question you have gone through the gauntlet and came out victorious sir wow man that was a lot you guys dang um you threw them at me tonight i'll give you that um great actually let me just say to you guys i mean those were all solid great questions not that they're never great questions. they're always great questions but those were really good I appreciate you guys asking and taking the time to listen to me ramble 
Sometimes I go off into these tangents. The first, I just said, let's keep the question, sh the answers short. short. And the first one, the guy asked such a great question that I've been dying to talk about a topic of of high end mass versus mass produced that I just went right off the rails. <laughs> um, these are topics I could talk about for ever, and I don't shut up. Okay, so let's. I know it's eight o'clock uh, now, and we're supposed to end the stream, but let's do a few little things more on this, just so we're not ending on the stream with questions. I want to do a little more. Let's do a few little things on this mask, and then what we'll do is we'll. Uh, how do you guys feel, Ryan, Sam? Let's do a third episode of this guy sure. with finishing. Yeah. Like, because what I would like to do is show the eye, the teeth, and the tusks next time and finish techniques like what do i seal the mask with what do i use to seal it how do i epoxy the eye blah 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 blah. because everybody asks me that all the time i get that's probably one of the biggest questions i get is what sealers i use or how do i seal a mask so um and those sealers aren't too toxic they're pretty they're varnishes so they're not too bad i mean they're a little stinky but not like chemically stinky so we could do it indoors and, and get away with it so uh let's go to See what else we want to do on this real quick before we end the stream tonight. Um, let's see here. Oh, okay. Let me show two last techniques, or well, not techniques, but things that I wanted to hit on. And one was some, some different veins, um, which I'm going to actually use uh, purple that I didn't use last time. And we're going to mix a real dark red, a dark purple red tone for like broken capillary veins. You know, when you get older or older people, you'll see it in their noses and their cheeks and things. You'll see those kind of blood vessel-y broken, I guess they call it a broken capillary, right? Something like that. I think I'm saying that right. I think that's what it is. Uh, you know, so... Um, I'm going to take this dioxine purple and let's take some, we need kind of a dark, let's do this maroon red. Maybe even a touch of light red here. Let's see. Oh, I don't want that chip of paint landed in there. Don't let any chips of paint get in there. That's not good. We might even need some black. Let's see. That's pretty good already. Let's get it darker though. Mm -hmm. And then I've got some black FW. Don't need a lot of that because it's powerful, man. That black FW is potent. <clears throat> uh, di dioxine purple is a great color, by the way. I highly recommend that for, for mixing your own purple tones, especially when you want dark, dark purple tones. It's a great color, especially for aliens and stuff. I use dioxine purple on almost every alien I paint. <clears throat> Okay, so we've got this nice dark, dark color here. Let me just put a little water. Remember, we were talking about the thinning. So here's the water. Okay. That's the water. Now we're going to do the alcohol. This is 99% alcohol. Do a little bit of that. The blueberry chocolate sauce. <laughs> I'm hungry. <laughs> Not when I put it on, you won't be. So. <laughs> well, that's a little, you know what? Yeah, that's a little, boy. That's a little wrong of what I wanted here. Sorry, guys. That's, <laughs> I think the black really killed it, and I don't didn't realize it. Let me, uh, let me try and lighten this up. Now, typically, you wouldn't do this, like mix new paint in to the alcohol. Oh, you know what? Sorry, I got this. This is, th this is thin with alcohol. I'm going to add this red, some of this red to this. Because it got a little dark on me. I think I didn't realize the black had gotten so potent. So let's see what we get here. If I add a little red. 
That's good. You guys can see me screw up and then I'll fix it. <laughs> okay, that's better. That's better. I don't know. Let's just try it. Shit. Let me even put some on this. I'm going to go and, and darken the edges of this wounded, like, little lip wound here that I got, too. Okay, so, what I was thinking is we can throw... It still needs to be more purpley, but, okay, I'll, I'll go with this for a minute. And these are, like, really sharp, aggressive... Uh, you know, veins. Yeah, let's get more purple in there. More purple and more red. Still just a bit too, too dark for my taste. So let's go and let's add. Yeah, you know, normally I wouldn't add paint back into this, but oh well. I think it'll be fine. All right. Let's get rid of the old paint. I'm going to spray that out. Let's see what we got here. Okay, maybe a little better. All right. Let's do this again. Come on. Yeah, that's that's better. So these are just like spidery little guys. You know, you could put them on the cheeks too. Um, here's a trick too. I learned. I picked this up by watching Steve Wang. Um, sometimes when he wants to do something very tight, and he wants to make sure that he's not too shaky or whatever, he'll put his hand your left hand next to your right hand and just steady it. And then you can kind of control, because if you do it like this and you're trying to do something tight with one hand, you'll be a little too shaky. This just, just rest your other hand here. And then you won't be as shaky. Now, this is like sun damage type skin stuff, you know, where he's got some capillary, uh, broken capillaries and things in his skin. And I mean, you know, this guy's probably out in the sun sometimes too much or something. I don't know. Or, he, you know, somehow he's, or maybe he's popping too many zits. I don't know. <laughs> But the skin has got some damage going on. So that's kind of this. You can kind of see there on the cheek there. These tight little veins. You'll, you'll see these in ears too a lot of times, you know. You'll see. You know, let's, let's, let's give the ear like some of those. See how cool that looks? Then I block it. See how cool that looks? You can't see. <laughs> block it um so yeah anyway this you just have to pick and choose where you want these things or but i always look at you know human faces where 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 these are i'm just doing some broad stuff there but yeah i always look at human faces to see where um typically these things land or develop let's say it that way on somebody Hey, that sounded like a bunch of Jawas in the middle of our stream. Did you guys hear that? That was my phone. Someone's texting me. All of a sudden I heard, like, you teeny. Ryan, you got Jawas living with you? What's, what's going on, man? Oh, usually always. Yeah, no, that's my, that's my text message. 
notification is Jawas. Which annoys my family and I love it. <laughs> oh, it's dad's phone again. <laughs> and then my ringtone is what, like Halloween? The the John Carpenter? Oh, the piano. <laughs> yep. It's awesome when I'm standing in like Home Depot or something and it just goes off blaring. Everyone just starts looking around. <laughs> And John Carpenter and his sons were touring not too long, a couple of years ago. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. They were doing like a live concert of all of his, his uh, awesome film scores and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. He did some albums too. Like, amazing, like, you know, John, just John doing music, you know, like, like without lyrics, just, just some, uh, you know, like, writing on the synthesizer or whatever he uses i don't know keyboard oh yeah yeah it is some of his film score works brilliant man and he uh i think part of uh i'm kind of a, a huge john carpenter film dork and his uh i think the last deal with the recent halloween movies his his whole thing was you know some creative input but he wanted to handle the soundtrack with him and his family and his son's help him orchestrate the score and uh it, it's awesome stuff yep. yeah what were you gonna say i was gonna say that oh yeah, yeah. like i think he did the score for the new movies yeah dude that that there's a there's a scene in the new not the newest one the first what was the first one halloween it's not halloween kills it's not halloween no. Ends. no 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 that's the last one halloween kills was the recent one um, but the first, what was the first movie that came out? Halloween, what was it? Brian, do you know? Yeah, I think it was just titled Halloween, and, uh, because it required the date. Oh, is it, yeah, was it just Halloween? Why am I thinking it was, they had a name, like Halloween, or is it just, okay, so it's Halloween, Halloween kills, Halloween ends, right? Um, yeah. All right. Well, anyway, that that new the new one. Oh God, I'm saying this wrong. Jesus Christ. Okay, the one that came out first, the the first one, prequel, whatever the hell it is. Anyway, when that when that girl gets hit on by that dorky nerd friend of hers. <laughs> yeah, it's just this one. Yeah, Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> There it is, right in front of my DVD. Oh my god! Yeah, I don't know why I couldn't. Th I kept thinking they gave everyone a name, each one a name, and now I'm like, I now I'm, to, I kept wanting to say like Halloween begins. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Halloween, Halloween begins. It should have just been Halloween begins. I'm like, again, Halloween. again. Yeah. No, Halloween begins again. No. Um. Well, okay. When the girl, when the 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 daughter, you know, because she's like not really buying it or whatever. The grandmother. Uh, Anyway, so this nerdy guy hits on her, and she's not into him, and whatever, and, and he dies on a fence, Michael Myers. But dude, when she's like crossing the street, and when that happens, when he shows up, there's that sound. I can't do it, but it's like this dark, brooding, like oh my god, dude, that yeah. to me was the scariest, freaky moment of that movie. You take that music away, and it's not scary at all. But that's the funny thing about Halloween. You know, the first movie, when they pitched it, supposedly it was pitched with no sound. And they were, like, laughing. Like, this is not scary. What is this, you know? And they were like, no, this is... And then they repitched it again with the sound. I mean, I'm not telling the story correctly. I know there's more to it. And, you know, Halloween fans are going to be like, God, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Hmm. Anyway, whatever. It, it, was, it was shown without sound, and they just didn't even find it scary at all. And then when they when Carpenter put the soundtrack to it, it totally changed that movie. You know, it was like, it was now scary, and and the music is such a huge part of every film. Obviously, you know, we know that we all know that, but but that sound effect, man, that that I remember that was like, and I don't get easily frightened or scared with Hall with Hall. It's hard for new movies to for me to get scared, you know. I, I just I think for all of us, you know, I mean, we always see those fans, you know, ah, you know, and you're like, well, how do they get scared by <laughs> I'm not even scared. But anyway, 
the the it doesn't matter. The bottom line is that sound, man. I thought was just such a killer. Uh, I don't know how he came up with that, but man, I love it. I, I, that's my favorite part when that hits. You know, it that's just like oh damn. Yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. That deep, the mirror. Yeah. yeah, it's like a super deep sound, but it yeah. just it hits really perfectly. Yeah, yeah, I love it. My buddy uh, Chris Nelson, who I just ran into uh, recently, he did all he does all the Michael Myers uh, effects. He's a he's the he's the cop. He's the he's one of the cops in the movie who gets his head cut off the first movie. That he's also the effects artist on uh, on the film, you know. One, one of there's Vincent Van Dyke too, who, who's amazing and, and helps him out. But uh, yeah, no, Chris Nelson, man, he does some he does some kick ass stuff. And that he, yeah, he's uh, he's been doing th- that Loomis makeup. I think th- I think Vince Van Dyke helped with that. That Loomis makeup was amazing, man. Holy shit, some some incredible I stuff. Think, I think Mabry helped with the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, too. I think. Justin Mabry helped with the mask. Um, um, yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't know the full story behind all that. A hundred percent. I mean, I've heard different tellings of his. I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I I believe he came in to to help out on that first film because I mean, you know, he has a, such a knowledge of that mask. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah, he could sculpt it sculpt it in his sleep at this point. You know. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know what the exact, uh, you know, who's credited where and whatnot and all that. I, I don't want to even get into that because that's a sensitive subject. But um, I know Nelson's effects uh, company is what does all the the stuff for those movies, and and uh, they do they do a lot of great work. And yeah, Justin is um, you know the Myers dude, the Myers guy. <laughs> that's how Trick or Treat has so many, you know, correct likenesses of Myers and all that but but let's not turn oh, yeah. this into a Myers show man let's not do that <laughs> yeah yeah not even then <laughs> I love the first Halloween movie man but I don't like getting into all that Myers stuff it's it's too goofy like too much stuff you know not trying to put that down or anything I mean, I, guys love it that's all good I get it but I love the uh, yeah the music the soundtrack of it more than anything I think yeah oh man like yeah the fog the fog is amazing. I'm just going crazy on this thing, you guys. I'm just noodling away like a crazy man. I'm gonna I'm gonna do one quick adjustment, and then we're gonna do one more step, and then we'll call it a we'll call it a, a <clears throat> oh my god, my voice is going. We'll call it a night in a sec here. Let's see here. I want to get one really creepy, gross, broken vein in this ear right there. Can you get in on that, Ryan? Uh, Sam? Not Ryan. So I'm just called you Ryan. Sorry. I'm going to confuse you guys here. Sorry. <clears throat> okay. One last thing here. I'm going to put a little more purple. But I'm going to do it right in my cup. Uh, I already did it. What am I doing? Okay. Grab your alcohol. Put it in there. Bam. Good to go. I'm just mixing this right in the cup of the airbrush quickly because um, I don't want to take time to, to mix a whole color again. I'm just doing a quick adjustment here <clears throat> what I'm trying to get is like a more purple here I'm just gonna go with this okay so what I want to do now is come in here and try to get there we go You know, some of these broken capillary things, you real close, you'll see like a tinge of purple in the little blood vessel or whatever it is that's broken or distressed or whatever. You can even take some of this and deepen this eye bag a, a touch too, you know. This dark purple. Really accentuate some of the, around the eye we want to focus everything right into this eye eventually you know like that's one of the first things we look at and we can take this dark deep purple and go into the lips a little bit i still have some work i want to do on this lip for you guys i'm not i'm not quite there yet on it
monster. Let's do a little under shading under this nose. The edges, just a subtle under shading under there can help too to sell the shadowing. You can push the shadowing a little. <clears throat> monster. Monster. I'm starting to Casey, on your, feel this. On a, yeah. Oh, good. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry, buddy. I just throwing a suggestion out there you, uh, for one of your Instagram posts, just showing kind of your, you know, your the base paint before you've you've done anything, and then the after, because it, it's amazing. I mean, everyone saw, you know, your your the the base Pax paint coat, and just the kind of you know by the hearing that we're gonna launch a third episode with with uh, John Smith's awesome awesome uh, cyclops mask here um uh, i think people are digging it i think this is uh this has been a, a great tutorial for everybody rad yeah i hope that this helps you know those that are looking for it you know to improve their painting hopefully it helps them do that um hey there you know my buddy uh tim gore by the way speaking of tim which we were talking earlier about tim gore's paints he uh, he kind of threw out to me um, hey man, you know, why don't we just get together and do another mask jam paint job thing at your house and, and film it. And I think, you know, down the road at some point we'll, we will do that for, for everybody, you know, maybe put out a new, uh, I don't know about live stream like this cause it's not enough time to do a full mask unless, you know, we did like a long day, but I don't know about that. Uh, yeah. Last six hour live stream. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. Hey, everything's possible. But I think at the very least, what would be cool is to shoot another updated video between the two of us. You know, we have a blast working together, and and, uh, and it'd be great to get together with Tim again and, and just jam on a... Because we have very different styles, but we're able to co cohesively or put them together well, you know. Like, he's, he's much more into warm tones, uh, as I recall, and I'm more into cool tones, you know. So, but we can, we, we have a way to put it together. I'm not, the Stan Winston one was actually us showing totally different styles. It wasn't really working together, but, it, but we can, you know, painters can, I've worked with Tim on, on films and yeah. Anyway, I'm rambling again. No, that, that would be an outstanding um, oh. <clears throat> yeah. idea, Casey. I think there's a lot of people who are big fans of that Stan Winston video that the two of you did. Yes, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, it'd be cool to do again. Um, speaking of which, to all you guys out there who live in the California area um, here, uh, I have stopped, I stopped for a long time, as some of you may know, or, or maybe don't, doing live classes or in-person classes, you know, where you come to my studio and learn uh, directly with me um i had to st you know as all of us we had to stop because of covid and all this stuff but now that things have become less dangerous and and then you know covid and all that and there's vaccines and all that good stuff um you know i'm i'm gonna be announcing finally after what two and a half years uh, of no classes i'm just getting ready to announce my next live in-person painting class and there's probably only going to be one or two for the year, if, if that. So, or that, that's about it, actually. So, because it's hard for me to fit these, fit them in with my schedule. They're, they're on weekends, you know. So, just letting you guys know, I will be doing a uh, uh, posting. Sorry, I'm trying to, trying to paint and talk at the same time. It's not working. I will be posting my new class. There's only 10 seats available at these classes. You come to my studio, uh, my, my home studio in paint, and there will be only 10 people, uh, 10 seats open. And I'm planning a pretty awesome uh, one-day class. It's a one-day class. It's a smaller piece. It's not this big. It's not like a mask or a giant mask or whatever. It's smaller resin pieces, but pa it's painting, and um, one, which is one of my most popular classes. So... You know, if you're interested in that sort of thing and you want to come take a class with me uh, and learn in person, then that's the way to do it. And uh, I will announce those soon. Um, 
Do we have that werewolf head here? You know that clay werewolf head? One of the, I'll show you guys one of the pieces. Is that over there? Um, I'll show you guys one of the, or that to your, over here, sorry, by the Batman. God, I wish I could do that Batman. That'd be sick, but nope. All right, so the uh, yeah, I'm going to finish this off, uh, this thing here to show you guys. This is just still very rough, but I'll be finishing off this uh, werewolf. We can show them that. This is a concept, by the way, for a, a mask I'm going to be doing for a guy. And um, anyway, I'm, I'll finish. It's not finished. It's all rough on one side. I'll be finishing this piece off and casting a resin. I'll have separate... Uh, translucent teeth and gums and um, this will be one of the two pieces in that we do in the class that we paint the other one will be a weird vampire thing so it'll be this guy and like a vampire so a werewolf and a vampire and I'll be taking you through painting in a one day eight hour workshop both pieces so look for that soon okay all right so let me get to the last step because we gotta we gotta get we're going over on the stream here and it's getting late and and i apologize uh we had a little crazy start today and uh, a lot of stuff to wear, figure out hopefully everyone's sticking with us okay so this has gone a long way already part two let me do one last step to this part two mask or part two of painting skin and then we'll call it a night and then you guys can get ready for next monday part three which we will finish the eye the teeth and the rest and the tusks and the ceiling eyes eye teeth and and ceiling that'll be part three um so for the last step here um what i want to show you guys really quickly is another sponging layer but a different one a different color much different color and this will give all the underneath layers some nice translucency. So what I'm going to do is uh, take white. Take some white, like so. And then we're going to take this yellow, this, and a little bit of flesh. Okay. And then uh, water. Let's thin this out. It's going to be like an egg yolk color. And this one does require some trial and error. Well, all sponging does. You have to try it out and see if it's going to work. But we need to wet the sponge again. Get it rejuvenated and alive so it'll work. Okay. <clears throat> All right, I always give it a little squeeze in the paper towel <clears throat> just to get excess water. You want it to be damp but not soaking wet. That's another uh, tip for you guys. That looks a little powerful to me. We'll see though. Okay, so now I'm going to do this and it might seem very weird at first. <laughs> Let me see if it's the, the, right, the right consistency. It might be too washed out. Because what you don't want is it too soft and washed out. It looks a little washed out. So let me mix a little more color in. So white. Touch of yellow. Flesh. I just shake the tray around like that. And <clears throat> okay. Now let's see what we got here. Okay. I mean, at this point, you could even just do a light flesh tone if you want. But what we're looking for is a nice uh, breakup on the skin. Let me get some of the paint off. dog barking in the background get him sick him sick him boy no. <laughs> just kidding 
dinner time. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thought that was your actual wolf sculpture barking. I was like, wait a minute, what's going on? <laughs> down, boy, down. Down, Cujo. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can see... Um, now, one trick is to go in and airbrush noodle real tight veins. And maybe I'll show you guys that a little bit next week as well, if I have time, uh, that version of this. But this is a quicker, uh, less finger pain <laughs> version of it. And it works great. I've, I've done this so many times now on mass, and it just looks awesome. Um, and it just sort of uh, gives a nice... Uh, it, may, it just sort of makes all the layers underneath come together and look translucent and interesting. Now, I didn't get to the shaved head technique. I'll, I'll also, we'll throw that in next week, too. We can fit that in. That's a quick, a quick technique to make it look like he's got like a shaved head. Oh, I didn't get to the zits, either. Darn. All right, we'll get to that, too. Anyway, taking notes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> remind me. Next stream, next week's stream will be great because we got a lot of that. Well, this one was great too, but we got a lot to do next week too, so it'll be awesome. Um, you know, yeah, I just you, you can see, I just basically pat, pat on, take off, pat on, take off. Um, every once in a while, I'll, I'll wet the back end of the sponge and then sort of, uh, you know, dry dry it back out a little bit on the paper towel if I feel like it's not uh, blending down the uh, the little splotches enough. But, you know, because sometimes it'll get a little. I live in California, so you know it dries out quick here. So uh, so dry. My voice is <laughs> gone. Do 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 do. And uh, the great thing again is, like I said, this is a quick, easy technique. Um, just don't overdo it. Don't don't put the paint on too heavy. You know, uh, make sure you can you blend every time you you back off with the paint that you go you go in and blend, uh, sponge blend it down, and um, you know, it's it's not hard. It's very easy to do. It gives you an amazing look too to your mask. It'll look awesome. And if you're more comfortable just doing a light skin tone, you can do that too. <clears throat> I may have to go back and, you know, punch a few little things like the beauty marks and the, the freckles and stuff, but that's okay. Because it, it will knock down, you know, Things. But like you can see right in here, man, it starts to look like real skin, you know. Um, to get into cracks, if you want to get into a crack, just push it out with your finger. Okay, just push it out. If you if you're finding like, oh, I can't get into an area, you know, like the back of like the back of this ear, push it, and then you'll see the sponge can get in there because there's always tricky spots that you feel like the sponge maybe can't get into. Um, one thing I would recommend with this technique is don't sponge the whole mask and then try to go back and blend. Don't do that. The, the paint will dry too fast, and then you won't get. There's no way you'll get the, the the all the all the paint blended. You know, like like just do little areas at a time. Trust me on that. <laughs> you, you won't be happy. You'll be bummed. So I just work. You can see I just work little areas. And then, and if there's an area I can't get in, like I can't get in there, okay, I'll just push it out. Then I can get in. Man, I'm showing you guys all the techniques. <laughs> um, if you haven't watched the first episode, episode seven of this mask, you should check that out. We start from a base coat and work all the way out to where we started on this stream. I didn't do any work in between. I just didn't have time last week to, to touch the mask. Um, so it's great because you guys are actually seeing an entire paint job from scratch, uh, just by watching two episode, two live stream episodes. And by the time we get the third one, there'll be a whole entire paint job done. So 
Yeah, there you go. And even come into the eyelid a little bit. All right, spongy, 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 spongy. But yeah, this is the way to get a nice, really cool translucent feel to your mask. Okay, I gotta, I gotta tip him a little bit here. It's gonna be weird. Weird angle. See if we can get a little bit of that lip. I can see I got to get underneath this top lip better with some painting. But we'll do that. Save it all for next time because we got to call it an evening here. We're coming down to the end. No! You're going to have to go back to your boring Monday night. Mm. I'm sorry. <laughs> or you can just watch more live streams that we've got up. <laughs> Remember, guys, please, please like and subscribe um, our, our live streams because it really helps us out. We can't do this without you guys. You know, um, it's you guys that make this possible. And we will be here each and every Monday night with you guys making monsters and... On Monday Night Monster Jam and we've got lots more to show you guys so please help us out like and subscribe get some friends if you know uh, recommend it to others if you know anyone that would like this we would appreciate it so we can keep growing this community that we've got going on right now which is awesome we appreciate all you have done for us both here and at the Facebook group page and I think I am satisfied for now with Mr. Cyclops by the amazing John Smith, who sculpted this, by the way, um, who unfortunately is no longer with us. Um, sadly, John Smith was an amazing mask maker. Um, it's fun to put life to some of his pieces here with paint. I wish he was still around so he could see these. That would be awesome. Um, anyway. Oh, I forgot to post this on the Death Studios forum. I just realized. Darn it. All right. I'll have to remember that for next time. All right, guys. I think that's going to do it for me tonight. I think we've shown you guys quite a bit here. And we are going to follow up more on this guy next week. We'll hit some, we'll make some tusks. I'll show you how I do that. We will paint the teeth with the tusk. We'll paint the eye. And maybe a shaved head and zits. And we'll seal it up and make it come to life right before your very eyes. So, from me, Ryan, thank you again for your time. Sam, thank you again for your time. You guys rock. All you followers out there, all you YouTubers, thank you so much. Appreciate you guys hanging with us for another Monday Night Monster Jam. And we are going to see you again next Monday night. For more painting and then following that Monday we're gonna go back to some awesome sculpting so thank you so much bye